section sixty five of heims kringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and ira ker magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of sigurd the jerusalem fairer eystein and olaf part four chapter thirty three through forty two chapter thirty three a woman brought to the king on yule eve so befell on a time on yule eve as the king sat in the hall and the boards were set that the king said fetch me flesh meat lord said they it is not wont in norway to eat flesh meat on yule eve he answered if it be not the wont then will i have it the wont so they came and had in porpoise the king stuck his knife into it but took not thereof then said the king fetch me a woman into the hall they came thither and had a woman with them and she was quaffed wide and sighed the king laid his hand to her head and looked on her and said an ill-favoured woman is this yet not so that one may not endure her then he looked at her hand and said an ungoodly hand and ill waxen yet one must endure it then he bade her reach forth her foot he looked thereon and said a foot monstrous and mickle much but one may give no heed thereto such must be put up with then he bade them lift up the kirtle and now he saw the leg and said fie on thy leg it is both blue and thick and a mere whore must thou be and he bade them take her out for i will not have her chapter thirty four harold gilly came into norway halkill hunch the son of john butterbear was a landed man in mere he fared west over sea and all the way to the south isles where came to meet him west from ireland he who hight gilchrist who said that he was the son of king magnus barefoot his mother followed him and said that he hight harold by another name halkell took these folk to him and flitted them over to norway with him and fared straightway with harold and his mother to meet king sigurd and they bare forth their errand before the king king sigurd set this matter forth before the lords that each might lay word thereto after his mind but they all bade him have his own way in the matter then let king sigurd call harold before him and told him he will not gainsay him proving his fatherhood by ordeal but on such terms that harold shall let that be made fast that though that fatherhood turn out as he saith he harold shall crave not the kingdom while king sigurd or magnus the king's son be alive and this bond fared forth with oaths sworn king sigurd said that harold should tread bars for his fatherhood and that ordeal was deemed somewhat hard whereas it was to be gone through but for the fatherhood not for the kingdom which he had already forsworn but harold yea said it he fasted unto iron and that ordeal was done which is the greatest that ever has been done in norway whereas nine glowing ploughshares were laid down and harold walked them barefoot and was led by two bishops three days thereafter the ordeal was proven and his feet were unburnt after that king sigurd took kindly to the kinship of harold but magnus his son had much ill-will to him and many lords turned after him in the matter king sigurd trusted so much in his friendship with all the folk of the land that he bade this that all should swear that his son magnus should be king after him and he gat that oath sworn by all the land's folk 
chapter thirty five of the wager of harold and magnus harold gilly was a tall man and slender of build long-necked somewhat long-faced black-eyed dark of hair quick and swift of gait and much wore the irish raiment being short clad and light clad the northern tongue was stiff for him and he fumbled much over the words and many men had that for mockery harold sat on a time at the drink with another man and told tales from the west of ireland and this was in his speech that in ireland there were men so swift foot that no horse might catch them up at a gallop magnus the king's son overheard that and said now is he lying again as he is wont harold answers true is this that says he those men may be found in ireland whom no horse in norway shall outrun on this they had some words and both were drunk then said magnus now here shalt thou wager thine head if thou run not as hard as i ride my horse but i will lay down against it my gold ring harold answers i say not that i run so hard but i shall find those men in ireland who so will run and on that may i wager magnus the king's son answers i shall not be faring to ireland here shall we have the wager and not there harold then went to bed and would have naught more to do with him this was in oslo but the next morning when matins were over magnus rode up unto the highway and sent word to harold to come thither and when he came he was so dight that he had on a shirt and breeches with foot-sole bands a short cloak an irish hat on his head and a spear shaft in hand now magnus marked out the run harold says over long art thou minded to have the run magnus forthwith marked it off much longer and said that even so it was over short there were many folk thereby then took they to the running and harold ever kept at the withers but when they came to the end of the run said magnus thou holdest by the girth and the horse drew thee magnus had a goutland horse full swift they took again another run back and then harold ran all the course before the horse and when they came to the end of the run harold asked held i by the girth now magnus answers thou didst take off first then magnus let the horse breathe a while and when he was ready he smote the horse with his spurs and he came swiftly to the gallop then harold stood still and magnus looked back and called run now says he then harold swiftly overran the horse and far ahead and so to the run's end and came home so much the first that he laid him down and sprang up and hailed magnus when he came thereupon they went back home to the town but king sigurd had been meanwhile at mass and knew naught of this till after meet that day then spake he in wrath to magnus ye call harold a fool but methinks thou art the fool whereas thou knowest not the manners of outland men didst thou not know before that outland men train themselves at other sports than filling their paunches with drink or making themselves mad and fit for naught and knowing nothing of a man hand over to harold his ring and never ape him again while my head is above mould chapter thirty six skill in swimming once when king sigurd was out on his ships they were lying in harbour and beside them was a certain chapman an ice land keel harold gilly was in the fore room of the king's ship but next to him further forward lay svein son of rimhild he was son of Canut, son of svein of jadar sigurd sigurdson was a landed man of renown who steered a ship there that was a fair weather day and hot sunshine and many men fared a swimming both from the long ships and the chapmen a certain icelander who was a swimming made a game of shoving down those men who were worser at swimming thereat men laughed king sigurd saw that and heard so he cast off his clothes from him and leaped out a swimming and made for the icelander grips him and thrusts him down and held him under and the next time that the icelander came up straightway the king shoved him down again and so time after time 
then sigurd sigurdson said shall we let the king slay the man a man said that no one was full eager to go sigurd said there would be a man there too if de eilifson were here so therewith sigurd leaped overboard and swam to the king took hold of him and said tyne not the man lord all men may see now that thou art much the best swimmer the king said let me loose sigurd i shall bring him to bane he wills to drown our men sigurd answered we too shall play together first but thou icelander strike out for the land and so he did but the king let sigurd loose and swam to his ship and so withal fared sigurd but the king spake and bade sigurd never be so bold as to come into his sight this was told to sigurd so he went up a land chapter thirty seven of harold and svein rimhildsen in the evening when men fared to sleep some men were ashore playing harold was at the play and bade his swain fare out on to the ship and dight his bed and bide him there the swain did so the king was gone to bed but when the page thought the time was long he laid him on harold's bed then svein rimhildsen said a shame it is for doughty men to fare away from their homes for this to drag their knaves up here as high as themselves the swain answered saying that harold had sent him thither svein rimhildsen answered we deem it naught so over good a hap that harold should lie here though he drag not up thralls here or staff carls and therewith he gripped a cudgel and smote the lad on the head so that blood fell over him the swain ran straightway up a land and tells harold what has befallen harold went straightway up on to the ship and aft into the fore-room and smote with his hand axe at svein and gave him a great wound on the arm and straightway harold went up a land again svein ran up a land after him and drifted there to his kinsmen and laid hands on harold and were minded to hang him but while they were making things ready then went sigurd sigurdson on board king sigurd's ship and waked him but when king sigurd opened his eyes and knew sigurd he said for this same shalt thou die that thou hast come into my sight for i bandit thee and the king leaped up sigurd spake that choice thou mayest have as soon as thou wilt king but other business now is first more due bear at thy swiftest up a land and help harold thy brother for now the rogelanders will hang him then spake the king god heed it now sigurd call now the horn swain and let blow the folk up after me the king ran ashore and all who knew him followed him even to where the gallows was dight forthwith he took harold to him and all the folk rushed straightway to the king all weaponed when as the horn had called out then said the king that svein and all his fellows should fare as outlaws but at the bidding of all men it was gotten of the king that they should have land dwelling and their goods but the wound should be unatoned then asked sigurd sigurdson if the king would that he should fare away then that i will not said the king never may i be without thee chapter thirty eight miracle of king olaf wrought on a man whose tongue was cut out kolbein hight a young man and a poor but thor the mother of king sigurd jerusalem fairer let shear the tongue from the head of him for no greater guilt than that this young man kolbein had had a morsel out of the dish of the king's mother and said that the cook had given it him as he dared not take that on himself because of her sithen spared this man speechless a long while this einar skullison sets forth in the dropper of olaf the noble horn of whiting for a young man's guilt but little let from the head be shorn out the tongue of poor wealth craver all guileless we beheld him horde breaker reft of speaking a few weeks later when as we were whereas tis lithe height sithence he sought to thrandheim and nadois and waked at christ church but at matin song on the second vigil of olaf he fell asleep and thought he saw olaf the holy come to him and betake his hand to the stump of the tongue and draw it but when he awoke he was whole 
and fainly thanked our lord and king olaf from whom he had gotten healing and mercy he had fared thither speechless of four and sought to his holy shrine and thence fared he whole with a clear speech chapter thirty nine miracle of king olaf on a war taken man the heathen men took captive a certain young man a dane of kin and flitted him to wendland and had him there in bonds with other war taken men now was he by daytime in irons alone and unguarded but at night was the son of the master in fetters with him lest he should run away from him but this poor man gat never sleep nor rest for grief's sake and sorrow in many ways he would be thinking what help there might be for him much he dreaded thraldom and feared both of hunger and torment yet no ransom could he hope for from his kinsmen for the reason that they had set him loose twice before from heathen lands with money so he deemed he knew that now they would think it both too great a matter and too costly to undergo it a third time well is the man who does not abide all the evil in this world which he deemed now he had abided now there was nothing for him but to run away and to get off if that might be fated him so next he takes reed in the dead of night and slays the son of the master and hews the foot from him and so makes away to the wood with his fetters but the next morning when it lightened they are aware of this and fare after him with two hounds who were wont to this to scent out whosoever ran away and they find him in a wood whereas he lay hid from them so now they lay hands on him and beat him and baste him and play with him all kind of ill sithence they drag him home and leave him but bare life and show him no other mercy they drag him to the pains and set him straightway into a murk chamber wherein were already sixteen men all christian there they bound him both with irons and other bonds the fastest they might so he deemed those woes and pains which he had had before as if they were but a shadow of all the evil which then he had no man set an eye upon him in this prison who prayed for mercy for him no man thought pity of that wretch save the christians who lay there in bonds with him they grieved and greeted for his woe and their thraldom and mishap but on a day they laid this reed before him and bade him behide him to the holy king olaf and give him to service in the house of his glory if he might get him by god's mercy and his prayers from that prison this he yea said fain and gave himself forthwith to the place they bade him the next night he thought he saw in his sleep a man naught high stand there anigh him and speak to him on this wise hearken thou wretched man says he why risest thou not up he answers my lord what man art thou he answers i am king olaf on whom thou didst call oh ho good my lord says he i would fain rise up if i might but i lie bound in irons and withal chained in fetters to those men who sit herein bound then the man calls on him and speaks thus in words stand thou up swiftly and bewail thee not for of a surety thou art now loose next to this he awoke and told his fellowship what had been born before him so they bade him stand up and try if it were true up standeth he and kenned that he was loose now said his other companions and spake it that this would come to nothing for him for the door was locked without and within then laid word thereto an old man who sat there in the most woeful plight and bade him not distrust the mercy of this man by whom he had already got him loose and so said he for he must have done a token on thee that thou mayest enjoy his mercy and be free henceforth and not for more wretchedness and torment to thee now show thyself death says he and seek the door and if thou mayest get out thou art halpen so he did finds the door open straightway and runs out forthwith and off to the wood so soon as they were aware of this then they lay on their hounds and fared after him at their swiftest but he lieth and hideth him and sees clearly wretched carl where they fare after him 
now the hounds go astray from the spoor as they draw nigh him and they all got bewildered of sight so that no one might find him and yet there he lay before their very feet so they wend them home thence and bewailed much and sorrowed that they should not have happened on him king olaf let him not be undone but when he had got into the wood gave him hearing and all health whereas they had before beaten all the head of him and bruised it till he was deafened next here too he got into a ship with two christians who had been long pined there and all of them they made use of that craft to the utmost and thus were flitted their ways from that path of flight sithence he sought to the house of this holy man and was then grown whole and fight worthy but then he rued his behest and broke his word to that merciful king and ran away one day and came at evening to a bonder who for god's sake gave him harbour sithence in the night when he was asleep he saw three maidens come to him fair and goodly of array who cast words at him at once browbeating him with heavy white for being so overbold to run away from that good king who had shown him so mickle mercy first that he loosed him from the irons and then altogether out of the prison and to keep aloof from that sweet lord under whose hand he had gone next thereto he awoke full of fear and stood up so soon as it dawned and told this to the master and that good bonder would allow no otherwise for him but to wend home back to that holy stead this miracle was first written by him who himself saw that man and the marks of the irons on him chapter forty king sigurd takes cecilia to wife when as king sigurd's lifetime wore this new hap befell his reed that he will leave the queen alone and get him that woman hight cecilia the daughter of a mighty man he was minded to dight the bridal in Bjorgvin and led array a mickle feast and glorious but when bishop magni heard that then was he unmerry and on a day goeth a bishop to the hall and with him his priest who was hight sigurd and was sithen's bishop in Bjorgvin. they come to the hall and the bishop bids the king come out and he did so came out with a drawn sword the king gave good welcome to the bishop and bids him come to the drink with him he said that other was his errand is it true lord that thou art minded to marry and to leave the queen alone the king said that is true thereat the bishop began to swell mickle and said how does it seem good to thee lord to do this within our bishopric and to put to shame god's right and holy church and thy kingdom now shall i do that which i am bound to to ban thee thus unread on god's behalf and the holy king olaf and the apostle peter and all holy saints while he spoke he stood straight up and as if he stretched forth his neck in case the king should let the sword sweep down and so has said sigurd sithens who was bishop thereafter that the heavens seemed no bigger to him than a calf's skin so awful did the king show to him sithens went the king back into the hall but the bishop went home and was so gay that every child he greeted laughing and played with his fingers then spake priest sigurd ye are merry forsooth lord cometh it not into thy mind now that the king may lay his wrath on thee and that it would be likelier to seek a way then said the bishop likelier meseemeth that he will not do that but how might my death day be better than to die for holy church banning that which is not to be endured now am i merry that i have done that which i ought to do sithens was there to do in the town and the king's men arrayed them for departure with much corn and malt and honey and now the king maketh south for stavanger and there arrays the feast and when the bishop who bore rule there heard thereof he meets the king and asks if it be true that he is minded to marry the queen yet living the king said that so it was the bishop answers if that be so lord thou mayest well see how much that is banned to the smaller folk now it is not unlike thou mayest deem it free whereas thou hast more might to let such things beseem thee but yet is that much against the right and not what i why thou wilt do that within our bishopric to the shame thereby of god's commandments and holy church and our bishopdom 
now therefore thou wilt lay down somewhat big in monies to this stead and so boot god and us then said the king there take the money wondrous unlike are ye thou and bishop magni and away went the king no better pleased with this one than the other who laid forbidding thereon sithens he gat this woman for wife and loved her mickle chapter forty one the furthering of the cheaping stead at king's rock king sigurd let so much further the cheaping stead at king's rock that there was none richer in norway and he sat there mostly for the guarding of the land he let house the king's garth in the castle he laid it on all the country sides which were anigh the cheaping stead and on the town's folk withal that every twelve month each man of nine winters old and upwards should bring to the castle five weapon stones or five beans else and these should be done sharp at one end and be of five ells height there within the castle let king sigurd do cross church it was a treen church and done with much care both of stuff and fashion when as sigurd had been king for four and twenty winters then was hallowed this cross church then let king sigurd be there the holy cross and many other holy relics this church was called castle church there before the altar he set up an altar table which he had let make in greek land it was done of brass and of silver and fairly begilded and beset with smalts and gemstones there was a shrine which eric ever minded the dane king had sent to king sigurd and a plenary written in golden letters which the patriarch had given to king sigurd chapter forty two the death of king sigurd three winters after the hallowing of cross church king sigurd gat a sickness when as he was staying in oslo and there he died one night after merrimus in autumn he was buried at hallward's church and was laid in the stone wall out from the choir on the south side magnus the son of king sigurd was then in the town and he took straightway all the king's treasures when the king died sigurd was king over norway for seven and twenty winters he was forty years of age his times were good for the land's folk there was both good increase and peace withal end of the story of sigurd the jerusalem fairer eystein and olaf part four chapter thirty three through forty two section sixty six of heims kringle by snorri sturleson translated by george pope morris and Iriker magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of magnus the blind and harold gilly part one chapter one through five chapter one the beginnings of magnus the blind and harold gilly magnus son of king sigurd was taken to king over all the land at oslo even according as all the all folk had sworn to king sigurd and the many men straightway then took service with him and landed men with all magnus was fairer than any men who were then in norway he was a man big moody and grim a man of great prowess was he but the friendship of his father fetched him his most friendship with the all folk he was a great drinker a wealth luster rough and ill to deal with harold gilly was a right wise man merry and playful humble-minded bounteous so that he spared naught to his friends and easy of read so that he would let others have their way with him in all matters they would all these things stood him instead for good hap of friendship and good report so that many mighty men were drawn to him no less than to king magnus harold was then in tunsberg when he heard of the death of king sigurd his brother and forthwith he had meetings with his friends who made up their minds to hold a how thing there in the town at that thing harold was taken to king over half of the land and then was that called need forced oaths whereby he had sworn away from his hand his father's heritage harold took a court to him and made landed men and soon an host drew to him no less than unto king magnus then fared men betwixt them and so it stood seven nights 
but whereas king magnus gat much lesser folk he saw nothing for it but to share the land with harold and in such wise was it shared that each should have one half against the other of the realm that king sigurd had had but ships and board array and precious things and all chattels that king sigurd had had king magnus had yet was he the worser pleased with his lot however for a while they ruled over the land in peace though each kept his counsels much to himself king harold begat a son called sigurd on thora the daughter of guthorn greybeard king harold gat ingigrid the daughter of rognevald who was the son of ingi the son of steinkol king magnus had for wife kristin daughter of canute lord and sister of valdemar the dane king king magnus grew naught loving to her and sent her back south to denmark and sithens all went the heavier for him and mickle unthank gat he from her kindred chapter two war between harold and magnus the kings whenas they had been kings for three winters magnus and harold they sat both the fourth winter north in cheaping and each gave other home bidding and yet was it ever at the point of battle with their folk but toward spring king magnus sought with a ship host south around the land and drew to him folk all that he might and seeks of his friends if they would to get him strength hereto to take harold from his kingdom and to allow him so much of dominion as might seem good to himself and he sets it forth to them how harold had aforetime forsworn the kingdom king magnus got hereto the consent of many mighty men king harold fared to the uplands and so by the inland road east unto wick he also drew folk to him when he heard of king magnus doings and wheresoever they went each hewed the other's beasts and slew each other's men king magnus was mickle more manned for he had all the main of the land for folk getting harold was in the wick on the east side of the firth and drew folk to him and then each took from other both men and goods was then with harold christrod his very mother's brother and many landed men were with him yet mickle more with king magnus harold was with his host at a place called the force in ranrealm and went thence out towards the sea on the eve of lawrence wake they ate their meat at night whereas tis called fur relief but the warders were a horseback and held horse guard all ways about the stead and therewithal were the warders ware of the host of king magnus that they fared now to the stead and king magnus had nigh on sixty hundreds of men while harold had but fifteen hundreds then came the watch and bare the news to king harold and said that the host of king magnus was come upon the stead harold answers what may our kinsman king magnus will never will it be that he shall will to fight with us then answers theostolf allison lord thou wilt have to make reed for thee and this folk as if king magnus will have been drawing an host together all the summer to this end that he will fight with thee so soon as he should find thee then stood the king up and spake to his men and bade them take their weapons if magnus will fight thereon was the blast blown and all the host of harold went out from the stead into a certain acre garth and there set up their banner king harold had two ring burnies but christrod his brother had never a burney he who was called the most valiant of men when king magnus and his men saw the host of king harold they arrayed their host and made so long an array that they might ring around all harold's host so says halder gabbler more mickle long gat magnus the rank wing there he leaned on a many folk warm slaughter did cover up the meadow chapter three battle at fur relief king magnus let bear before him the holy cross in the battle there was mickle battle and hard christrod king's brother had gone with his company in the midmost array 
of king magnus and hewed on either hand and men shrunk the two ways before him but a certain mighty bonder who had been in the host of king harold was standing at the back of christrod and reared aloft his spear two-handed and thrust it through his shoulders and it came out through the breast of him and there fell christrod then spoke many who stood by why he did that ill deed he answers now he wotteth how that they hewed my beasts last summer and took all that was at home and had me perforce into their host such i minded for him erst if i might but get the chance thereof after that came flight into king harold's host and he fled away himself and all his host then were fallen a many of king harold's folk there gat his bane wound ingimar of ask the son of svein a landed man of king harold's host and nigh sixty of the bodyguard so king harold fled east into the wick to his ships and fared sithens to denmark to find king eric ever minded and besought him of avail when they met south in sea-land king eric gave him a good welcome and the most for this sake that they had sworn brotherhood between them he gave to harold halland for maintenance and dominion and gave him eight long ships unrigged after that fared king harold north over halland and then came folk to join him king magnus laid all the land under him after this battle he gave life and limb to all the men who were hurt and let tend them as his own men for he called then all the land his and now he had all the best choice of men who were in the land but when they took counsel together then sigurd sigurdson and thorir the son of ingerid and all the wisest men would that they should hold the flock in the wick and abide there if harold should come from the south but king magnus took the other way with his wilfulness and went north to bjorgvin and sat there through the winter and let the host fare from him and the landed men to their steads chapter four bonders give themselves into the king's power king harold came to king's rock with the host which had followed him from denmark then landed men and townsfolk had a gathering there before him and set their battle in array up above the town but king harold went up from his ships and sent men to the host of the bonders and bade them that they should not battle him from his own land and gave out that he would claim no more than he had right to have and men fared betwixt at last the bonders gave up the gathering and went under king harold's hand then gave king harold for his hosting fiefs and grants to the landed men and bettering of rights to the bonders they who turned into the host with him after that much folk gathered to king harold he fared by the east round the wick and gave good peace to all men save the men of king magnus them he let rob and slay wheresoever he came upon them and when as he came from the east unto sarpsburg then took he there two of king magnus's landed men asbjorn to wit and nereid his brother and gave before them the choice that one should hang and the other be cast into the force of sarp and bade them choose themselves betwixt them asbjorn chose to fare into sarp for he was the older and that death was deemed the grimmer and so was it done this halder gabler telleth asbjorn who held evil words with the king must needs be striding forth into sarp wide feedeth the king the hawks of battle then king let hang up nereid upon the grim tree baneful of cigars foe paid scatterer of wave flame speech of house thing after that king harold went north to tunsberg and there had he good welcome and mickle host gathered to him chapter five of counsels king magnus sat in bjornvid and heard these tidings then he let call to talk with him all such lords as were then in the town and asked them for read as to what wise things should be dealt with then answers sigurd sigurdson here too can i lay good reed let man be a cutter with good men and true and get for a master thereof me 
or some other landed man to fare to meet king harold thy kinsman and bid him peace according as right wise men here in the land may settle between you such that he shall have one half of the realm against thee and this seemeth likely that by the pleading of good men king harold will take that bidding and that thus there will be peace betwixt you then answered king magnus i will not have this choice or of what avail was it that we won under our sway the whole of the realm last autumn if we shall now share away one half thereof give some other reed hereto then answers sigurd sigurdson so meseems lord that now thy landed men sit at home and will not come to thee they who in harvest pray thee for leave to go home thou didst that then much against my reed to let drift so much that multitude which then we had for i deemed i wotted that harold and his would seek back to the wick as soon as they should hear that it was lordless now is there another reed toward and ill it is yet maybe it will do do to fare home thy guests and other folk with them against such landed men who will not now bestir them in thy need and slay them and give their goods to such as be trusty to thee though hitherto they have not been of much account let them whip up the folk have thou evil men no less than good and then fare east against harold with what folk thou mayest get and fight him the king answered unbefriended will that be to let slay many great men and to heave up little men instead for they have oft failed no less and the land were worse man than erst i will hear yet more read of thine sigurd answered now is reed giving growing troublous to me in that thou wilt not make peace and wilt not fight fare we north then to thrandheim where the land's might is most for us and take all the folk we may get on the way and perchance the elf grims will thus weary of drifting after us the king answered i will not flee before those whom we chased last summer so give me some better reed then stood up sigurd and made him ready to go and said then i shall read the reed which i see thou wouldst have and which will be followed sit here in Bjorgvin till harold come with a crowded host and then thou wilt have to foe either death or shame else and sigurd was no longer at this talk end of the story of magnus the blind and harold gilly part one chapter one through five section sixty seven of heims kringra by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and i recur magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of magnus the blind and harold gilly part two chapter six through twelve chapter six of king harold's host king harold fared from the east along the land and had an all mickle host this winter was called throng winter king harold came to beorgvin on yule eve and laid his host into floru bites and would not fight on yule for its holiness sake but king magnus let array him in the town he let rear a slaughter sling out in home and let make iron chains with wooden spars betwixt and lay them right athwart the bite over from the king's garth to monkbridge on northness he let forge caught trops and scatter them about over unto john's meads and only three days in the yule tide were holden holy from smith's work but on the outgoing day of yule king harold let blow the host to give way in yule tide nine hundreds of men had gathered to king harold chapter seven king magnus taken king harold behight to king olaf the holy for victory to let do an olaf's church there in the town at his own cost only king magnus set his battle in array out in christ's churchyard but king harold rode first over to northness 
but when king magnus and his saw that they turned up into the town and into bite bottom and as they fared up the street then ran many townsfolk into courts and to their homes but those who fared over unto the meads ran against the caltrops then saw king magnus and his folk that king harold had rode all the host over into hernwick and went there up on to the bents above the town then turned king magnus out along the street and then his host fled away from him some up into the fell others some up past nunseat some into churches or they hid them in other places king magnus went on board his ship but there was no chance for them to fare away for the iron chains held them from without few men withal followed the king and therefore were they good for nothing so says einar scullison in harold's droppa the bjorgvin wick week long they locked for the serfs full steers was no departing a little thereafterwards came king harold's men out aboard the ships and then was king magnus laid hand on whereas he sat aft in the foreroom on the high seat chest and with him hakon falk his mother's brother the fairest of men albeit not called wise but ivar son of ozer and many other friends of his were then laid hand on and some were slain straightway chapter eight the maiming of king magnus then king harold had a meeting with his council and bade them take reed with him and at the close of this meeting it was settled to take magnus from kingdom in such wise that he might never thenceforth be called a king so he was given into the hands of the king's thralls and they gave him maiming stung out his eyes to wit and hewed from him one foot and at last was he gelded ivar son of ozer was blinded hakon falk was slain after this all the land was laid under the sway of king harold and then there was much seeking after those who had been the greatest friends of king magnus or who would most wot of his treasures or his precious goods king magnus had had the holy cross with him ever since the battle befell at Thiraleith, and would not tell now where it was become reinald bishop of stavanger was an englishman and was called much wealth yearning he was a dear friend of king magnus and men thought it like that into his keep had been given much money and precious things so men were sent for him and he came to bjorgvin and this privity was laid to his charge but he denied it and bade the ordeal thereto king harold would not that but laid on the bishop to pay him fifteen marks of gold the bishop said he will not make his see poorer by all that he will rather risk life sithence they hanged bishop reinald out on home on a slaughter sling and when he walked up to the gallows he shook the boot from his foot and said and swore withal i know of no more of king magnus wealth than what is in this boot and in it was a gold ring bishop reinald was laid in earth in michael's church on northness and this deed was much blamed after this harold was sole king over norway while he lived chapter nine wonders at king's rock five winters after the death of king sigurd great tidings befell at king's rock at that time were rulers there guthorm the son of harold fletcher and seamond housewife who had for wife ingi bjorg the daughter of priest andres the son of bruni their sons were these paul flip and guni fis seamond had a base-born son hight asmund andres son of bruni was a man of great mark he sang at christ's church solvig 
hight his wife with them was then at fostering and rearing john the son of lopt eleven winters old priest lopt the son of seamund the father of john was also there the daughter of priest andras and solvig his wife hight helga whom einar had to wife now it befell at king's rock on the lord's night the next after easter week that a great din was heard out in the streets throughout all the town like as when the king fares with all his court and hounds went on so ill that they might not be heeded but broke out and all who came out became mad and bit all that was in their way man or beast but all that was bitten and that the blood came out of became mad and all creatures with young lost their birth and became mad hereof was minding well nigh every night from easter unto ascension day then men were much adrad of these wonders and many betook themselves away and sold their garths and went off to the country or else into some other cheaping towns and to all them who were wisest these things seemed of the greatest weight and they were afraid as forsooth it befell that this forewent some great tidings which were not come to pass but priest andras spoke long and deft on whit sunday and turned his discourse to a close in such manner that he spake about the trouble of the townsfolk and he bade men harden their hearts and not to void that glorious stead but rather take heed to themselves and look to their reed to guard them as far as in them lay against all things fire and unpeace and to pray to them the mercy of god chapter x the beginning of the battle of king's rock out of the town thirteen ships of burden were arraying them and were minded for Bjorgvin, and eleven were lost with men and goods and all on board but the twelfth was broken and men were saved but the goods lost then fared priest lopt north to Bjorgvin with all his belongings and he had everything safe the ships were lost on the vigil of lawrence eric the dane king and archbishop ozer sent word both to king's rock and bade them there to be wary about their town said that the wens had a great host abroad and harried wide against christian men and ever had the victory but the townsmen laid over little mind on their affairs and gave the less heed to it and forgat it the more the longer time wore on from that awe which had come upon them but on the day of lawrence wake when as high mass was being said came redeber the wen king to king's rock and had five hundreds and a an half of wen cutters and on every cutter were four and forty men and two horses dunham is hight the king's sister's son and uniber hight a lord who ruled over much folk those two lords rode with some of the host up the east branch round hissing and so came down upon the town but some of the host they laid up the west branch to the town they made land out by the stakes and landed there the horse and they rode up over brent ridge and so up round the town einar andras son-in-law brought these news up to castle church for there were the folk of the town and had all sought to high mass and einar came in when as priest andras was at his reading einar told men that an host fared upon the town with a many warships and some of the host was riding down over brent ridge then said many that that would be eric the dane king and people looked but for peace from him then ran all the folk down into the town for their goods and they weaponed them and went down to the bridges and saw straightway that it was unpeace and an host not to be put to flight nine east-faring ships floated in the river off the bridges which chapman owned and the winds laid these aboard first and fought with the chapman the chapman weaponed them and fought long and manly there was the hard battle ere the chapmen were overcome in this brunt the winds lost an hundred and a half of ships with all hands while the battle was at its most the townsfolk stood on the bridges and shot at the heathen but when the battle slackened then fled the townsfolk up into the town 
and scythians all folk to the castle and men had with them their precious things and all the goods they could take with them solvig and her daughters and two other women went up country when the winds had won the chapmen they went a land and kenned their folk and then was their scathe clear some ran into the town other some aboard the chapmen and took all the goods which they would with them and next to that they set fire to the town and burnt it all together along with the ships after that they made for the castle with all their host and arrayed them to besiege it chapter eleven another battle king redeber let bid them who were in the castle to walk out and have their life and limb with their weapons and clothes and gold but all they whooped against it and went out on the burg some shot some stoned some cast logs and then was mickle battle and men fell on either side but mickle more of the wens but solvi came up to the homestead height sunberg and there told the tidings then was jeered the war arrow and sent to skurbaga there was a certain guild drinking toward and a many men there was that bonder who hight over micklemouth he leaped up straightway and took his shield and helm and a mickle axe in his hand and spake stand we up good fellows take ye your weapons and fare we to give help to the town's folk for that will be deemed a shame by every man that heareth thereof if we sit here swilling us with ale while good men and true shall be laying their lives in peril on our behalf in the town many answered and spake against it said that they would tine themselves and bring no help to the town's folk then leaped up over and said though all other dwell behind yet shall i fare myself alone and certes the heathen shall lose one or two for me or ever i fall so he runs down to the town men fare after him and will see his faring and also if they might help him somewhat but when he came so near to the castle that the heathen men saw him there ran against him eight men together all weaponed but when they met the heathen ran round about him over reared up his axe and smote the forward horn thereof under the chin of him who stood at the back of him so that the jaw and the windpipe were smitten asunder and this one fell aback face upmost then he swung the axe forth before him and hewed another on the head and clave him down to the shoulder then they shot at each other and he slew yet two and was himself much wounded and the four who were left fled therewith over ran after them but a certain ditch was before them two of the heathen leaped thereinto and over slew them both and then he too stuck fast in the ditch but two heathen out of the eight got away the men who followed over took him and flitted him back with them to skurbaga and he was healed whole and that is men say that never has a man fared manly or faring two landed men sigurd gerdson brother of philip and sigurd came with six hundreds of men to skurbaga and there sigurd turned back with four hundred men and was thought scythians of little worth and lived but a short while but sigurd fared with two hundred men to the town and fought there with the heathen men and fell with all his folk the winds sought to the castle but the king and his captains stood without the battle on a certain stead whereas the winds stood was a man who shot from a bow and did a man to bane with every arrow before him stood two men with shields and sheltered him then spake Seamund to asmund his son that they should shoot at the shooter both at once and i shall aim at him who bears the shield and he did so but that man shoved the shield before him then shot asmund between the shields and the arrow came on the brow of the shooter so that it came out at the nape and he fell aback dead and when the wen saw that they all howled as dogs or wolves then let king redeber call to them and bid them life and limb but they would have none of it scythians gave the heathen a hard onset there was one of the heathen men who went so nigh that he went right up to the castle door and thrust his sword at the man who stood within the door but men bore on him shot and stones and he was shieldless but so much cunning was he that no weapon bid on him 
then priest andras took hallowed fire and signed it and cut tinder and set fire thereto and set it on an arrow point and gave it to asmund and he shot this arrow to the wizard man and so bit that shot that he had enough and fell dead to earth then let the heathen ill like as erst howled and gnashed then went all folk to the king and it seemed to the christian men that reed might be forward that they the heathen would get them gone therewithal wadded an interpreter who knew wendish what that lord said who is named uniber so spake he this is a fierce folk and ill to deal with and though we take all the wealth that is in this place yet might we well give as much again that we had never come here so mickle folk have we lost and so many captains now first to-day when we fell to fighting with the castle they had for their defence shot and spears then next they beat us with stones and now they beat us with sticks like dogs so i see thereby that their stuff for warding them is drying up therefore we shall give them a hard brunt and try them so was it even as he said that there they shot logs but in the first brunt they had borne shot weapons not wrecking and stones withal but when the christian men saw that the much logs were minishing they hewed a twain each log but the heathen set upon them made a hard brunt and rested between whiles now on both sides men got weary and wounded and amidst of a lull the king let bid them life and limb and that they should have their weapons and clothes and whatsoever they could themselves bear out of the castle by then was fallen seamond housewife and that was reed of men they who were left to give up the castle and themselves into the power of the heathen men and the unhandiest of reeds was that whereas the heathen kept not their word they took all men carls queens and bairns slew a many all that was hurt and young and seemed to them ill to flit after them they took all the wealth that was in the castle they went into cross church and robbed it of all its plenishing priest andras gave king redeber a staff done with silver and gilded and to dunamis his sister's son of finger gold whereby they deemed they wotted that he would be a man of rule in the stead and held him of more worth than other men they took the holy cross and had it away they took also the table which stood before the altar which king sigurd had let do in greek land and had into the land but they laid it down on the grades before the altar then walked they out of the church then said the king this house has been wrought with mickle love to that god who this house owns but meseems this that little heed has been had of this stead or house for i see that god is wroth to those in whose keep it is king redeber gave to priest andras the church and the shrine the holy cross the book plenarium and four clerks but the heathen burnt the church and all the houses that were within the castle but the fire which they kindled in the church slaked twice then they hewed down the church and then it began to blaze all within and burned even as the other houses then fared the heathen with their war catch to their ships and kenned their folk but when they saw their scathe then took they for war catch all the folk and shared it between the ships then priest andras and his fared aboard the king's ship with the holy cross then came dread over the heathen from this foreboding that over the king's ship came so mickle heat that they all deemed themselves nigh to burning the king bade the interpreter ask the priest why that betid he said that the almighty god in whom the christian men trode sent them a mark of his wrath in that they were so overbold as to lay hands on the mark of his passion they who would not trow in their own shaper and so mickle might goeth with the cross that oft before have betid such tokens to heathen men who have laid hands on it yea and some yet clearer the king let shove the clerks into the ship's boat and priest andras bore the holy cross in his bosom they led the boat forth and long of the ship and forward about the beard and aft along the other board to the poop and sithens shoved forks thereat and thrust the boat away in towards the bridges sithens fared priest andras with the cross by night to sunberg and there was both storm and rain andras flitted the cross into safe keeping king redeber and his host what was left thereof fared away and back to wendland 
and many of the folk that had been taken in king's rock were for long afterwards in wen land in bondage but all they who were loosed out and came back to norway to their heritage became all of less thriving but the cheaping of king's rock has never sithen gotten such uprising as was erst chapter twelve of magnus the blind magnus who had been blinded fared sithens to nadois and betook him to a cloister and took monks raiment then much harness in froster was made over to that cloister for his maintenance but the winter after harold ruled the land alone and gave peace to all men who would have it and took many men into his bodyguard who had been with magnus einar skullison says so that king harold had two battles in denmark one at hevden the other by helles isle thou the toil eager dyer of raven's mouth thou lettest on men untrusty reddened thin edges neath high hevden and this withal thou high sark's hardy redner fight hadst thou off the flat strand of helesi there where gales blew the banners o'er the warriors end of the story of magnus the blind and harold gilly part two chapter six through twelve section sixty eight of heims kringler by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and ira kerr magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of magnus the blind and harold gilly part three chapter thirteen through eighteen chapter thirteen of king harold gilly and bishop magnus king harold gilly was the most bounteous of men so it is said that in his days there came from iceland for bishops hallowing magnus einarson and the king was wondrous well with him and gave him great honour and when the bishop was out bound and the ship all bound he went to the hall where the king drank and greeted him dearly and hailed him the king welcomed him well and blithely the queen sat beside the king then spake the king lord bishop art thou now bound to depart he said that so it was the king spake thou didst not hit upon a good time whereas thou art come when the boards are up now there is naught to give thee so worthy as should be or what is there to give the bishop the treasurer answered given away now we deem are all the precious things the king said there is yet left this board beaker here take that bishop there is wealth therein the bishop thanked him for the honour done him then said the queen fair hail and happy lord bishop the king spake to her fair hail and happy lord bishop what noble woman heardest thou so speak to her bishop and give him naught she answers what is there to now lord the king said there is the bolster under thee sithence that was taken it was sheared out of paul and the dearest of things was that and when the bishop turned away the king let take the bolster from under him and said long have they been together sithence the bishop fared away and came out to iceland to his chair and then was it talked over what should be made of the board beaker for the most honour of the king the bishop asked for reed thereon and men said it should be sold and the worth thereof given to poor people then said the bishop other reed will i take a chalice shall be made thereof here at this sea and thereover will i so say avail it him and i would that sithence all they the holy men of whom are holy relics in this church the holy would let it avail him whenever mass is sung over it and that chalice is there sithence at the stead scald holt and of the pieces of the pall that were drawn over the bolsters which the king gave the bishop there are they now made for song copes and are there still in Skalholt. in this matter may one mark king harold's greatness of mind as in many other things 
though here there be but little written thereof chapter fourteen the beginnings of sigurd slembi deacon a man is named sigurd who grew up in norway and was called the son of priest adelbricht the mother of sigurd was thora the daughter of saxi in wick and sister to sigrid the mother of king olaf magnusson and Kerry king's brother who had to wife borghild the daughter of de eilifson their sons were these sigurd of eastort and de the sons of sigurd were these john of eastort thorstein and andrus the deaf john had to wife sigrid the sister of king ingi and of duke scully in his childhood sigurd was set to books and he became a clerk and was hallowed a deacon but when he was full come to age and strength he was of all men the most valiantest looked and the strongest a mickle man and in all prowess was he beyond all of like years and well nigh every other man in norway sigurd was early a man mickle masterful and brawling and he was called slembi deacon he was the goodliest of men to behold somewhat thin-haired yet well-haired now this came up before sigurd that his mother said that king magnus barefoot was his father and so soon as he came to rule his ways himself he thrust aside clerkly ways and fared away from the land and in those fairings he dwelt a long while then arrayed he his ways to jerusalem and came to jordan and sought to holy relics as palmers are wont and when he came back he dwelt in cheaping voyages one winter he was stayed some while in the orkneys and was in the company of earl harold at the fall of thorkel fostilling the son of summerlid sigurd was also up in scotland with david the scot king and was held there of great account sithens fared sigurd to denmark and that was his say and the say of his men that there he had flitted cordeal for his fatherhood and it bore it out that he was the son of king magnus and that five bishops had been thereat so says ivar son of ingimund in the sigurd balk made ordeal o'er the shielding's kin five bishops the foremost deemed so went the trial that of this mighty and bounteous king was magnus father the friends of king harold said it had but been the guile and lying of danes chapter fifteen sigurd in iceland that is said of sigurd slumby that he had to do with chafer fairings certain winters one winter he was in iceland and was that winter with thorgill's oddison in sowerby and few men wotted who he was it betid in harvest when as weathers were driven into the fold and were had eye upon for slaughtering that as they were laying hands on the weathers one of them ran towards sigurd as if it sought thither for help sigurd reaches his hand towards it and lifts it out of the fold and lets it run up into the fell and said no more seek trust to us now than that trust shall to them be that befell also in the winter that a woman had stolen and thorgils was wroth with her and would punish her she ran there for help whereas was sigurd and he set her down on the dais beside him thorgils bade him hand her over and tells him what she had done but sigurd bade peace for her since she has come for help to me so forgive her her trespass thorgil said she should be pined therefore and when sigurd saw that he would not hear his prayer he leaps up and drew his sword and bade him come on and when thorgil saw that he will ward her with fight the man seemed to him to be of mickle countenance and he misdoubted him who he might be and so forbore to do aught to the woman and gave her peace more outland men were there and sigurd made the least show of himself one day when sigurd came into the chamber there was an eastman 
playing at tables with a home man of thorgill's and he was a man of mickle bravery of array and took much on himself the eastman called to sigurd to give him read of the game he looked on it and said he deemed it lost now the man who played with the eastman had a sore foot and his toe was swelled and ran sigurd sat down on the dais and drew a straw along the floor but kitlings were running about the floor he draweth ever the straw before them till it came over the man's foot but he sprang up and cried out withal and the table was upset so now they fell to wrangling which had it for this reason is this told because sigurd was deemed to have done a deft trick naught wadded men that he was learned till the wash day before easter when he sang over water and all the more was thought of him the longer he tarried the next summer ere they parted sigurd said that thorgils might send men to sigurd slemby as one who knew him then answers thorgils how far art thou from his kindred he answers i am sigurd slemby deacon the son of magnus barefoot thereupon he fared abroad chapter sixteen of guile against sigurd slemby when harold had been king over norway for six winters sigurd came to norway and went to see king harold his brother and met him at Bjorgvin, and went forthwith to the king and made clear to him his fatherhood and bade the king take him as kinsman the king gave no swift decision out on that matter but bare it before his friends and had talk and meetings with them but from their talk came that up that the king bare guilt at the hand of sigurd concerning that how he had been at the slaying of thorkel fosterer west beyond sea thorkel had followed king harold to norway then when he had first come into the land and he had been the greatest friend of king harold now this matter was followed up so fast that there was sigurd cast for death and by the reed of landed men it came about that late of an evening certain guests went whereas was sigurd and called on him to come with them and took a certain cutter and rode away from the town with sigurd and south into northness sigurd sat aft on the chest and thought over his case and misdoubted him that this would be some treason he was so arrayed that he had on blue breeches and a shirt and a mantle with cords for overcloak he looked down before him and had his hands on the mantle cords and whiles did it off whiles over his head but when they had come about the ness they were merry and drunken and rode at their utmost and took little heed of their ways then stood up sigurd and went to do his easement overboard but the two men who were gotten to guard him stood up and went to the board with him and took the mantle both of them and held it before him as is wont to be done with mighty men but whereas he misdoubted him that they had hold of more of his garments then gripped he each in either hand and cast him overboard with all that but the cutter sped far forward and it was a slow work for them to turn and long the tarrying before they got their men taken up but sigurd took such a long dive away from them that he was up a land before they had turned their ship after him sigurd was of all men the swiftest of foot and he takes his way upland and the king's men fared and sought for him all night and found him not he lay down in a certain rock rift and grew much cold so he did off his breeches and cut a hole in the seat gore and slipped it on and took his hands through and thus he helped his life for that while the king's men fared back and might not hide their misadventure chapter seventeen treachery to king harold sigurd thought he found that it would not help him to seek to find king harold and he was about in hiding places all through the autumn and early winter he was in the town of Bjorgvin in hiding with a certain priest and laid plans if thereby he might be the scathe man of king harold and in these reeds with him were a much many men and some who even then were of king harold's court and household but they had formerly been courtmen of king magnus but now they were in mickle good liking with king harold so that there were ever some of them who sat over the board with the king lucia mass in the evening talked together two men who sat there and one of them said to the king lord 
now have we put the decision of our quarrel to thy settlement for we two have each of us laid wager of an ask of honey i say that thou wilt lie to-night by queen ingerid thy wife but he saith that thou wilt lie by thora the daughter of guthorm then the king answered laughing and was much unwitting that this asking was of such mickle guile and said thou wilt not win the wager and thence from they deemed they knew where he was to be found that night but the head-watch was then holden before that chamber wherein most folk thought was the king and wherein slept the queen chapter eighteen the slaying of king harold sigurd slemby deacon and certain men with him came to the chamber whereas the king slept and broke open the door and went in with drawn swords and ivar colbynson first won work on king harold but the king had laid down drunken and slept fast and awoke therewith that men were smiting on him and spake in his unwit sorely dealest thou now with me thora she leaped up thereat and said they deal sorely with thee who will thee worse than i there lost king harold his life but sigurd with his men went away and then he let call to him those men who had behind him their fellowship if he should get king harold taken from his life days then went sigurd and his men aboard a certain cutter and men dight them to the oars and rowed out into the bight unto the king's garth and then the day began to dawn then stood up sigurd and spake to those who stood on the king's bridges and gave forth the slaying of king harold at his hand and bade them take him to them and this withal to take him to king as behooved of his birth then there drifted thither on to the bridges a many of men from the king's garth and answered all as if they spake with one mouth and said that that should never be that they should give obedience and service to the man who had murdered his brother but if he were not thy brother then hast thou no kindred to be king they smote their weapons together and judged them all to outlawry and out of peace then was the king's horn blown and all landed men and all the body guard were summoned together but sigurd and his men saw that for their fairest choice to get them gone so then he went to north hordland and had there a thing with the bonders and they went under him and gave him king's name fared he then into sagan and there had a thing with the bonders and there too he was taken to king fared he then north into the firths and there he was well welcomed so says ivar ingi munson took to the bounteous magnus son hordes and sogners when fallen was harold swore there a many men at thing to the king's son in his brother's stead king harold was buried at christ church the old End of the story of magnus the blind and harold gilly part three chapter thirteen through eighteen section sixty nine of heims kringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and iriker magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of ingi son of harold and his brethren part one chapter one through ten chapter one the beginnings of kings sigurd and ingi ingerid the queen and with her the landed men and the bodyguard which king harold had had arreeded it that a swift cutter was arrayed and sent north to thrandheim to tell the fall of king harold and that withal that the thrandheim folk should take to king sigurd the son of harold who then was north there and sigurd the son of bard fostered him but queen ingerid fared forth with east into wick ingi hight a son of her and king harold who was a fostering there in the wick with amundi the son of gerd the son of la bursi but when she and hers came into the wick a borg thing was summoned and there was ingi taken to king then was he in his second winter to this reed turned amundi and theostolf son of ali 
and many other mighty chiefs but when the tidings came north to thrandheim that king harold was cut off from life then was taken to king sigurd the son of king harold and to that reed turned otar breitling peter son of sheepwolf and the brothers guthorm of rhineir the son of asolf and otar bali and the many of other chiefs and under the sway of those brethren turned nigh all the folk and of all things mostly for this sake that their father was called holy on such terms was the land sworn to them that under no other man should it go while any one of the sons of king harold was yet alive chapter two of sigurd slemby deacon sigurd slemby deacon sought north beyond stad and when he came into northmere there were come already letters and tokens of those counsellors who had turned under obedience to the sons of king harold and there he got no acceptance or upraising but whereas he was himself of few folk he and his arreded to shape their course for thrandheim whereas he had already sent before him word in thither to his own friends and to the friends of king magnus who had been blinded and when he came to cheaping he rode up into the river nid and they got their hawsers ashore at the king's garth yet had they to make off again for all the folk withstood him sithence they laid to home and there took out of the cloister magnus the son of sigurd against the will of the monks for he had erst taken monks hallowing but it is most men say that magnus came out of his own free will though the other tale was done for the bettering of his case sigurd hoped to gather folk hereby and so it turned out this was close after yule fared sigurd and his folk down the firth sithens sought after them bjorn eaglesson gunnar of gimsar haldor sigurdson aslak hakenson and the brothers benedict and eric and the bodyguard which had erst been with king magnus and the many of other men they fared with their flock south about mere and all till off the mouth of roundsdale there they sundered their company and sigurd slumby deacon fared west over sea straightway that winter but magnus fared unto the uplands and looked for mickle folk to him there which he got and he was there through the winter and all the summer through withal in the uplands and had then much folk but king ingi fared against him with his band and they met there as it is height mouth there was mickle battle king magnus had more folk so it is said that the alstaff son of ali had king ingi in his kilt while the battle was and he went under banner and theostolf came into mickle need from toil and onset that is the talk of men that then king ingi got the ill health which he had all his life after his back was knotted and one leg was shorter than the other and so little of strength that it was ill walking for him while he lived then turned the manfall on to king magnus men and these men fell in the first array haldor sigurdsson and bjorn eaglesson gunnar of gimsar and a great part of king magnus host ere he would flee or ride away so says kali point storm with sword thou wroughtest o king beneath the war helm in the eastward off the mouth there the raven's host gat banquet and this withal before the king ring bounteous would fare away on field there lay all his chosen warriors the fight death king to heaven magnus fled thence east to goutland and so to denmark at that time was carl sonneson earl in goutland a mighty man and greedy magnus the blind and his men said wheresoever they came before great men that norway would lie loose before any great lords that would seek to it whereas there was no king over the land 
the sway of the landed men was over the land but all the landed men who first were taken to bear rule thereover were now at odds with each other for envy's sake now inasmuch as earl carl was greedy of dominion and gave good ear to talk thereof then gathers he folk and rides from the east into the wick and much folk went under him for fear's sake but when theostolf allison and amundi hear this then fare they to meet him with what company they could get and took king ingi with them they came upon earl carl and the host of the gouts east in crookshaw and had there another battle and king ingi won the victory there fell munnan ogmundson mother's brother to earl carl ogmund the father of munnan was the son of earl orm the son of eilif and of sigrid the daughter of earl finn the son of arni astrid the daughter of ogmund was the mother of earl carl many folk fell at crookshaw but the earl fled eastward out of the wood king ingi drave them all the way east out of his realm and there faring was of the foulest so says kali tell shall i how the lord king reddened the bright wound ice rods in gout's wounds dived the raven the urn him filled unseldom those hardeners of the sword din who made the war full soothly were paid for all at crookshaw thy might indeed is proven chapter three warfare of danes to norway then sought magnus the blind to denmark to find king eric ever minded and get good welcome there he bade eric to fare with him to norway if eric would lay the land under him and fare with a dane host into norway and says that if he comes with strength of host no man in norway would dare to shoot a spear against him hereat the king shaped his mind and bade out an host and fared with six hundred ships north into norway and in that journey were king magnus the blind and his men with the dane king but when they came into the wick they fared in some measure with peace and quietness along the east side of the firth but when they brought their host to tunsberg there was before them a great gathering of the landed men of king ingi waterworm dason brother of gregory ruled most over them there the danes might not come up a land nor get for them any water and a many of their men were slain then they stood up the firth for oslo and there was before them theostolf allison so goes the story that they would let bear the shrine of hallward the holy out of the town in the evening and so many went there under as could find room yet got it borne no longer than out on to the church floor but in the morning when they saw that the host came up on the west side of hetty then four men bore the shrine up out of the town but theostolf and all the folk of the town followed the shrine chapter four the town burnt in oslo king eric and his folk sought up into the town but some ran after theostolf and his folk theostolf shot a bolt at the man hight askel who was a forecastle man of king eric and smote him under the jaw so that the point showed through the nape and a better shot theostolf deemed he never had shot for naught was there bare on him save only that the shrine of the holy hallward was flitted up into realm realm and was there three months theostolf fared over realm realm and gathered folk through the night and came down to the town in the morning king eric let set fire to hallward's church and wide about the town and burnt all up outright then came theostolf down with mickle folk but king eric put off with his ship host and they might get a land nowhere on the northern side of the firth for the gatherings of landed men there and wheresoever they sought to go a land they left lying five or six or more of them king ingi lay in horn boru sound with mickle folk and when king eric heard thereof he turned back south to denmark king ingi fared after them and laid hand on whatsoever of them he might and that is the talk of men 
that never was fared a worse of faring into another king's realm with a mickle host and king eric liked mightily ill of king magnus and his men and deemed they had much mocked him whereas they had brought him on this faring and he gave out that he would not sithens be the friend of them such as he had been erst chapter five the warfare of sigurd slemby sigurd slemby deacon came that summer from west over sea to norway but when he heard of the unhap of magnus his kinsman he deemed he knew that he had little to trust in norway and so he sailed all outway south along the land and came forth into denmark and held into air sound but to the south of airy he came upon certain wind cutters and laid to battle with them and won the victory and ridded there eight cutters and slew many men but some he hanged he also had a fight at man with winds and had the day then held he from the south and hove into elf the east branch thereof and there overcame three ships of thorir havinandordi and olaf the son of harold halberd his sister's son the mother of olaf was ragnahild the daughter of magnus barefoot he chased olaf a land theostolf was in king's rock and had gathered against him and thither held sigurd and they shot at each other and men fell on either side and many got wounded sigurd and his men got no upgoing there fell wolf hedden son of saxolf a north countryman of iceland and sigurd's forecastle man sigurd put off again and held north into the wick and robbed widely he lay in portiria in limgarth side and waylaid there ships that went to or fro the wick and robbed them the tunsberg men made an host against him and came upon him unawares where sigurd and his were ashore sharing their plunder and some of the host came down on them and others laid ships athwart the haven outside of them sigurd ran aboard his ship and rowed out at them and the nearest ship was that of waterworm and he let back water and so sigurd rowed out by them and got away in one ship but many fell of his folk therefore was this sung waterworm not well was in stour there at portiria chapter six the slaying of bentine sigurd slemby deacon sailed sith and south to denmark and from his ship was lost a man called kolbein thorliotson of batald he was in the cock-boat which was in tow of the ship but they sailed much fast sigurd wrecked his ship when he came south and he was in the winter at alleberg but the next summer fared magnus and sigurd with seven ships from the south and came to listy unawares by night and laid their ships aland there was before them ben tyne son of kolbein a court man of king ingi and the most stout-hearted of men sigurd and his went up there in the lightning of the night and came unawares and took the houses on them and would lay fire in the stead but ben tyne got out into a certain bower with his war-gear and well bedight of weapons and stood inside the door with a drawn sword and had a shield before him and a helm on his head and was ready to ward him the door was somewhat low and sigurd asked why they went not in but they answered that no one was eager thereto but while they were in the height of their talk about this sigurd leaped into the house past him bentine hewed after him and missed him and then sigurd turned upon him and but few blows they gave and took ere sigurd slew him and bore his head out in his hand they took all the wealth that was in the stead and fared sithens to their ships but when king ingi and his friends heard of the sling of bentine and those kobinsons sigurd and gerd the brethren of bentine the king made an host against sigurd and his and fared himself and took a ship from under hakon pungelta the son of paul and daughter's son of aslak the son of erling of soli who was the son of the mother's sister of hakon ma ingi chased hakon a land and took every wit of their baggage these fled away into the firth sigurd stork the son of eindred of gautdale and eric heel his brother and andras welshit 
the son of grim from this but sigurd and magnus and thorleif skep sailed north by the outer course with three ships unto hologoland and magnus was through the winter in birch isle with vidcun johnson but sigurd hewed off stem and stern of his ship and sheared rifts therein and sank it in the innermost aegis firth but sigurd sat the winter through in tent sound at hin in the part called cluch firth in the upper part of the firth there is a cave in the bergs there sat sigurd and his winter over more than twenty of them and built up the door of the cave so that it might not be seen from the foreshore these gat sigurd vittle through the winter thorleif skep and einar the son of ogmund of sand and gudrun the daughter of einar the son of ari of reek knolls this winter it is said that sigurd let finns make him two cutters up the firths and they were sinew bound and had no nails therein and with these for knees and twelve men aside rode on each sigurd was with the finns while they made the cutters and the finns had ale there and made sigurd a feast there then sigurd sang this twas good in the fin cot while glad we were drinking and glad the king's son wandered twixt benches game was not wanting at gamesome drinking fain glad and fain there where a land he was these cutters were so swift that no ships might overtake them on water even as was sung few things will follow the fur of the halligs swift under sail is the sinew bound keel but in spring fared sigurd and magnus from the north with those two cutters which the finns had made and when they came to vagar they slew there the priest fine and his two sons chapter seven the slaying of william the skinner sigurd held then south into wick and there they took william the skinner who was a landed man of king sigurd's and another was thorald chaps and them both they slew then sigurd went south along the land and there came upon sturcar glossy tail south off berda when as he fared from the south from cheeping and him they slew and when sigurd came south to valsnes he hit upon swine grim there and let hew from him his right hand then he fared south to mere outside of frandheim mouth and took there hedden hard maw and calf kringle eye and he let hedden go away but calf they slew king sigurd and sigurd his foster father heard of the fairings of sigurd and what he was about so they sent out men to search for him and got for leaders thereof john cowder son of calf the wrong and brother to bishop ivar and another man withal priest john sparrowhawk to wit they manned the reindeer which was of two and twenty benches and of all ships the swiftest they fared to seek sigurd but found him not and fared back north with but little renown whereas men said thus that they saw them but durst not fall on them then fared sigurd south to hordaland and came to herdla there had dwelling einar the son of laxpal but he had gone into hammerfirth to ganging day's thing they took all the goods that was at home and a long ship of five-and-twenty benches which einar had and a son of his four winters old who lay by one of his workmen some would slay the lad but some would have him away with them the workman said it will be but little hap to you to slay this lad and no gain will it be that ye have him away for this is my son not einar's and for his words they let the boy alone and fared away but when einar came home he gave to the workman goods to the worth of two ounces of gold and thanked him for his doings and said he would be his friend ever after so says eric odson who wrote this story for the first time that he heard in bjorgvin einar paulson tell the tale of these haps then sigurd fared south along the land and all the way east to the wick and hit on finn the son of sheepwolf east at kvild as he fared to call in the land dues of king ingi and let hang him sithens fared they south to denmark chapter eight king ingi sends a letter 
the men of wick and of bjorgvin said it was unseemly that king sigurd and his friends should sit quiet north in cheaping even though his father's banesmen fared the highway outside of Fantime mouth and king ingi and his host sat east in wick in peril and warded the land and had had many battles then sent king ingi letters north to cheaping wherein there were these words to king sigurd his brother and seedgird and ogman sweep and otar brightling and to all landed men and courtmen and house carls and all the all folk happy and unhappy young and old king ingi the son of king harold sendeth god's greetings and his to all men are known the troubles we have on hand in our youth withal in that thou art five winters old and i am but of three winters and we too may bestir us in no matter but if we veil us of our friends and of good men now i and my friends deem that we are standing nigher to the trouble and the need of both of us than thou or thy friends now do so well as to fare to meet me at thine earliest and as much bemanned as may be and let us be both together whatever may happen now he is our most friend who holdeth to this that we be ever most holy at peace and that we be holden in all things most equal but if thou hang back and choose not yet to stir at my word as afore thou hast done thou shalt look to this that i shall fare on thine hand with an host and then let god judge between us for we may no longer put up with things as they are to sit with so mickle cost and such multitude of men as here is needed for unpeace sake while thou takest one half of all land dues and other incomings of norway live in god's peace the speech of otar brightling then answered otar brightling and stood up in the thing and said this is the word of king sigurd that this be said to king ingi his brother that god thank him for a good greeting and for the toil and trouble that thou hast and thy friends in this realm for the need of us both now though some things in king ingi's words to king sigurd his brother be found somewhat hard yet has he a mickle cause for his say in many wise now i will make known my mind and hear whether the will of king sigurd and other mighty men follow therewith to wit that thou king sigurd array thee with such host as will follow thee toward thy land and fare thou as much manned as may be to meet king ingi thy brother and when first thou mayest and let each of you strengthen the other in all matters happy and god both of you now will we hear thy words king peter the son of sheepwolf who afterwards was called peter burden swain carried king sigurd to the thing then said the king let all men wot that if i shall rule i shall fare to meet king ingi my brother when first i may but then one spoke after the other and though each began in his own way yet closed he his speech in one and the same manner as otar brightling had answered and then it was settled to gather an host and to fare east into the land sithens king sigurd went east into the wick and there met king ingi his brother chapter x the fall of magnus the blind the same harvest tide came sigurd slemby deacon and magnus the blind from the south from denmark with thirty ships both danes and northmen and this was nigh to winter nights but when the kings and their host hear these tidings they fare east to meet them they met at home the grey in whale isles the next day after martin mass which was sunday kings ingi and sigurd had then twenty ships and all big there was mickle battle but after the first brunt the danes fled with eighteen ships and home south and then were ridded the ships of sigurd and magnus and when the ship of magnus was much ridded and he was lying in his berth thrider the son of gritgarth who long had followed him and been his courtman took king magnus in his arms and was minded to run into another ship then was thrider shot with a spear between his shoulders and there through and so say men that king magnus got his bane from that very same spear and rydar fell back on the deck and magnus on the top of him and that saith every man that he may be deemed to have followed his liege lord well and valiantly good is it for each who getteth such good renown there fell loden sup proud of lionstead on board king magnus ship and brucy the son of thormod a forecastle man of sigurd slemby and ivar son of colbine and hallward the polisher a four-room man of sigurd slemby 
this ivor was the man who went in to king harold and first one stroke on him then fell mickle deal of the folk of sigurd and magnus for the men of ingi let none get away whom they could catch though i named but few men there too in one home they slew more than sixty men there were slain two men of iceland sigurd a priest son of bergthor the son of mar and clement the son of ari the son of einar ivar gaud hank the son of kalf the wrong who was sithens bishop north in thrandheim he was father of archbishop eric ivar had always followed magnus he got him into the ship of john cauda his brother who had to wife cecilia the daughter of gerd bardson he was there of the host of kings ingi and sigurd and these three got them into john's ship besides ivar to wit arnbjorn amby who sithens wedded a daughter of thorstein of Altsholt, but the third was ivar dint the son of starry and brother to helgi the son of starry but a thrandheimer by his mother's kindred and the goodliest of men but when the company was ware thereof that they were there they gripped their weapons and went at john and his but they in their turn got ready for them and the whole host was at the point of fighting between themselves but they came to peace in such wise that john ransomed his brother ivar and arnbjorn and hanselled bail for them and that money was given back to him sithens but ivar dint was led up a land and hewn down whereas the sons of kolbein sigurd and gerd would take no money for him for they laid to him that he had been at the slaying of bentheim their brother so said bishop ivar that that had so overcome him that it seemed to him the worst of things when ivar was led up a land under the axe and kissed them first and bade they might meet hail again so told gudrid the daughter of burger and sister to archbishop john to eric odson and she gave out that she had heard bishop ivar so tell end of the story of ingi son of harold and his brethren part one chapter one through ten section seventy of heims kringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and iriker magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of ingi son of harold and his brethren part two chapter eleven through twenty one chapter eleven sigurd slemby deacon laid hands on thrand rent master hight a man who steered a ship in king ingi's host and now things had so come about that ingi's men rowed in small boats after the men who were swimming in the sea and slew every one they caught sigurd slemby deacon jumped from his ridded ship into the deep and slipped off his burney in the dive swam sithens and had a shield over him but certain men from thrand's ship took a man swimming and would slay him but he prayed off and gave out that he would tell them where was sigurd slemby and that they would but shields and spears and men dead and garments were floating wide about the ships ye will see said he where floateth a red shield there under is he sithens rode they thither and took him and brought him to thrand's ship but thrand sent word to theostolf and otar and amundi sigurd slemby had had on him a tinder-box and the touchwood was inside a walnut shell done about with wax outwardly therefore is this told because it was deemed thoughtful to do it so up that it should never get wet therefore had he a shield over him as he swam because no one could tell whether that was his or some other one's shield since many were floating on the sea so said they that they would never have hit on him if it had not been told about him now when thrand came a land with him it was told to the men of the host that he was taken and a whoop of joy broke out through the host 
and when sigurd heard that he said many an evil man will be fain of my head to-day then went to him theostolf allison and strake a silken cap belayed with gold off his head and then spake theostolf why wast thou so overbold thou thrall's son to dare to call thyself the son of king magnus he answers no need for thee to square my father with a thrall for of little worth was thy father beside mine hall the son of thorgeir leech the son of stone was a courtman of king ingi and was anigh there when these things were betiding and he told this tale to eric odson who wrote it down after him eric wrote the book which is called backbone peace in that book is told of harold gilly and of his two sons and of magnus the blind and of sigurd slemby all unto their death eric was a wise man and was at this time long in norway some of his story he wrote down from the telling of hakon ma a landed man of the sons of harold and hakon and his sons took part in all these strifes and counsellings but eric names more men who told him of these tidings wise men and proven true who were anigh so that they heard or saw the things that happened but some he wrote down from his own sight or hearing chapter twelve of the torments of sigurd slemby hall says this that the chiefs would let slay him straightway but those men who were grimmest and deemed they had to wreak their harms upon him ruled his torments and thereto were named the brethren of bentine sigurd and gerd the sons of kolbein and peter burden swain withal would revenge finn his brother but the chiefs and most other folk went thence away they break his legs asunder with axe hammers and his arms withal then they stripped him of his clothes and were minded to flay him quick and they ripped the scalp off his head but they might not do it because of the blood rush then they took walrus hide whips and beat him long so that well nigh was the hide off as if it were flayed but sithence they took a stock and shot it at the backbone of him so that it went asunder then they dragged him to a tree and hanged him and hewed off his head sithence and dragged his body away and thrust it in a heap of stones that is all men say his friends and his unfriends that no man in norway within those men's memory who then were up was doughtier in all matters than was sigurd but a man of evil luck was he in some things so said hall that he spoke few and answered few though men put words to him but that says hall thereto that he started never therewith more than if they had been smiting a stock or stone but that let hall follow that it might be with a valiant man one well furnished with stoutness that he should stand pining so far that the man could hold his mouth and cringe but little thereat but sigurd said he never changed his voice and even as light-spoken was he as if he were on an ale bench within he never spoke higher or lower or more quavering than was his wont therein and he spake right on till he gave up the ghost and sang one-third of the psalter and it seemed to hall that he thought this overpassed the valour and strength of other men but the priest he who had the church a short way thence let bear the body of sigurd thither to the church and that priest was a friend of those sons of harold but when that was heard they cast their wrath upon him and let flit the corpse back to where it was before and the priest withal must needs pay geld therefor but the friends of sigurd fared sithence on a ship of denmark from the south after the body of him and brought it to alleberg and buried it at mary church in the town there 
so said provost kettle who was the ward of mary church in that town to eric that sigurd was buried there the astolf allison let bear the body of king magnus to oslo and bury him at hallward's church beside king sigurd his father loden sup proud they brought to tunsberg but all other folk they buried there chapter thirteen eystein son of harold comes from the west sigurd and ingi had ruled over norway for six winters that spring came eystein from the west from scotland and he was the son of harold gilly arni stour and thorleif son of berniolf and kolbein heap had all gone west over the main after eystein and followed him into the land and they held straightway north to thrandheim and the thrandheim folk took him up and he was taken to king at the air thing about the ganging days in such wise that he should have one-third of norway against his brothers sigurd and ingi were then east in the land fared men between those kings and appeased them in such wise that eystein should have one-third of the realm no ordeals were made for eystein towards his fatherhood for it was taken for true what king harold had given out there anent biadoc hight the mother of king eystein and she came to norway with him magnus hight the fourth son of king harold him kerping worm fostered he was also taken to king and he too had his share of the realm magnus was unhale of his feet and lived for but a little while and died of sickness of him einar skullison tells eystein gives wealth to people sigurd the shield din eketh ingi sets blows a singing magnus frames peace of manfolk the kin of the king most noble in blood the fight tent reddens never for brethren nobler under the sun come out yet chapter fourteen otar breitling slain after the fall of king harold gilly queen ingerid was wedded to otar breitling he was a landed man and a mickle lord a thrandheimer of kin and was of great avail to king ingi while he was in his childhood king sigurd was no great friend of his for he deemed he leaned altogether towards king ingi his stepson otar breitling was slain in a single fight north in cheaping one evening as he was going to evensong when he heard the whine of the stroke he turned up his arm and the cloak therewith against it and thought that a snowball had been cast at him as oft is the wont of young swains he fell at the blow but alf ruffian his son came therewith walking into the churchyard and saw the fall of his father and also that the man who had done the slaying ran eastward round about the church alf ran after him and slew him at the song-house corner and men said that the vengeance had gone well with him and he was thought a man much more thereafter than erst chapter fifteen the beginnings of king eystein haroldson king eystein haroldson was up thrandheim when he heard of the fall of otar and he summoned to him an host of bonders and fared out to the town and was full well manned now otar's kinsmen and friends laid this reed mostly on king sigurd who was then in cheaping and the bonders were much fierce against him but the king bade ordeal for himself and gave pledge for iron-bearing that so he should make good his case and thereby peace was made fared king sigurd after that into the south land and this ordeal he never delivered him of chapter sixteen the beginnings of worm king's brother queen ingerid had a son with ivar skewer who hight worm and sithens was called king's brother he was the fairest to look upon and became a mickle lord as later on yet will be told queen ingerid was given to arni of stadrheim he was sithens called king's stepfather 
and their children were ingi nicholas philippus in herdla and margaret whom bjorn the buck had to wife and after him simon the son of kari chapter seventeen the outfaring of erling askew erling hight the son of kirping worm and ragnahild the daughter of sveinki the son of steinar kirping worm was the son of svein Sveinson, the son of erland of garth the mother of worm was ragna the daughter of earl worm eilifson and sigrid the daughter of earl finn arneson the mother of earl worm was ragnahild the daughter of earl hakon the mighty erling was a wise man and a mickle friend of king ingi and through his counsel erling got to wife kristin the daughter of king sigurd and queen malmfred erling had a house at studla in south hordland erling fared away from the land and with him eindred the young and yet more landed men and had a brave company they arrayed them for a jerusalem faring and fared west over sea to orkney thence went earl ragnavald who was called Kali and bishop william and from the orkneys they had altogether fifteen long ships and sailed to the south isles and thence west to the land and that way sithens which king sigurd the jerusalem fairer had fared out to norfisound and they harried wide about spain the heathen shortly after they had sailed through the sound eindred the young parted company and those who followed him in six ships and after that each party went their own way but ragnavald the earl and erling askew hid upon a certain dromond on the main and laid there too with nine ships and fought with them and at last they laid the cutters under the dromond bear down on them then the heathen both weapons and stones and pots full of boiling pitch and wood butter erling laid his ship nighest to them and the weapon cast of the heathen went beyond that ship hewed then erling and his rifts in the dromond some below watermark some on the hall so that they fared in so says thorbjorn scald askew in erling's droppa swift northmen fearless hewed on the new hall board windows in the deep with war axe edges that was a work all willing wasters of eagles hunger from up above your wild saw upon the wave mew sheared ye with irons open breeches audun the red a forecastle man of erling's height the man who first went up on the dromond they won the dromond and slew there a wondrous many men and took there exceeding mickle wealth and won fair victory earl ragnavald and erling askew came in this fairing to jerusalem land and out to the river jordan then they turned back and first to mickle garth where they left their ships behind and fared the land road from the east and held them all hail till they came to norway and their journey was praised right much erling was deemed now mickle more of a man than erst both for his journey and for his wedding he was withal wise of wit wealthy and of high kindred and deft of speech withal and was most leaning in all friendship toward king ingi of all those brethren chapter eighteen the birth of hakon shoulder broad king sigurd rode a guesting with his court east into wick and rode through a stead that was owned of a mighty man called simon but as the king rode through the stead then heard he in a certain house singing so fair that he thought right much thereof and he rode to that house and looked in and there a woman stood at a quern and sang wondrous fair as she was a milling the king got off his horse and went to the woman and lay with her and when the king went away then wotted goodman simon what errand the king had had thither but she hight thora and was a workwoman of goodman simon sithens let simon take heed to her ways thereafter the woman bare a bairn and that child was named hakon and was called the son of king sigurd hakon was brought up there with simon son of thorberg and gunhild his wife there too were brought up the sons of simon and his wife onund and andreas to wit 
they loved hakon mickle and he them so that naught but death might sunder them chapter nineteen king eystein fought at leichberg king eystein haraldson was stayed east in the wick near to the land's end he fell to unpeace with the bonders of ranrealm and the dwellers of hissing so they made a gathering against him and he had a battle with them and gained the day that height leichberg where they fought he burnt with all wide in hissing sithens the bonders went under his hand and paid great fines and the king took borrows of them so says einar scullison king famed and gift free the wickmen paid he for their waywardly ways and luck turned to his days most folk were afraid ere they gat the peace made their fines eked he then and had borrows of men the king worked the fight with his brisk men and light nigh to leichberg a town of a widespread renown fast fled ran folk and paid whatsoe'er the king bade there the folk hansel gave for the wealth him to have chapter twenty king eystein's journey west a little after king eystein dight his faring from the land west over the main and sailed to cataness and heard that earl harold the son of madad was in thurso and he made there two with three small cutters and came upon them unawares but the earl had a thirty bench ship and eighty men thereon but whereas they were unready there gat king eystein and his men to board this ship and laid hands on the earl and brought him with them aboard their ship he ransomed himself with three marks of gold and therewith they parted so says einar scullison eight tens of men were standing along with the son of madad mighty wound sagan's mew feeder forsooth now grows renowned the wearier of the wave horse that earl took with three cutters corpse skua's valiant feeder gave the famed king his head there king eystein sailed thence south by the east of scotland and laid to the cheaping in scotland hight apardion and slew there a many of men and robbed the town so says einar scullison apardion folk fell as i have heard tell peace did the king tear break fight icicles there another fight he had south by hiardapal hartlepool with a host of knights and turned them to flight and he ridded certain ships there so says einar the king's sword bit well on spears the blood fell leal court followed on at hiardapool won hot rhine of the blade hugin's joy made wolf wine waxed ridded were ships of the english there then he held on south to england and had the third fight at whitby and got the victory and burnt the town so says einar the king made the fight strong and was there the sword song hills clouds cloven down at whitby the town fir shaw's dog on that day or the houses did play wolf's tooth reddened then grief was gotten for men after that he harried far and wide about england then was stephen king in england next thereafter king eystein had a fight at scarp scaries with certain knights so says einar fell fast the strings rain by the bold king was slain a shield cunning host at scarp scaries coast next to this he fought at pulwick and gained the victory so says einar sword the king reddened there the wolf host to tear the goodly like of ports in pulwick the king did earn all langton to burn west or salt and the sword gainst brows of men roared there they burnt langton a great thorpe and men tell that that stead hath gotten little uprising sithens after that king eystein fared away from england and back to norway in the harvest and men talked about this journey 
all unevenly chapter twenty one of the sons of harold good peace was in norway in the early days of the sons of harold and their neighbourliness was abiding in a way while their counsellors of aforetime lived but ingi and sigurd were children in years and so had but one court for both but eystein was by himself being a man of full age but when the following of ingi and sigurd was dead seedgird the son of bard to wit amundi the son of gerd thialstaf the son of ali otar breitling ogman sweep and ogman hammerer the brother of erling askew who was held of little account while ogman lived then ingi and sigurd sundered their court and then gregory the son of day who was the son of eilith and of ragnahild the daughter of skapti ogmanson betook himself to ingi and became his prop and stay gregory had store of wealth and was himself a man of the most ado and he became the chief ruler of the affairs of the land under king ingi who granted him leave to have of his own such as he would end of the story of ingi son of harold and his brethren part two chapter eleven through twenty one section seventy one of heimskringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and ira kirk magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of ingi son of harold and his brethren part three chapter twenty two through thirty two chapter twenty two of the ways of the sons of harold king sigurd became a much violent man and unpeaceful in all matters so soon as he was grown up yea he and eystein both though as for eystein he was more orderly of the two yet of all men the most avaricious and niggardly king sigurd became a mickle man and strong and valiant looking red of hair ugly of mouth but well as for other face shaping he was of all men the deftest in his speech and the doughtiest so says einer scullison mighty is sigurd's deftness who reddens the sharp fires of wound flood in the blood flow god's self the gifts him giveth when as the ready-worded king of the rom folk speaketh it is as hushed were others glad-spoken king doth grandly king eystein was a man swart of hair and dark of hue somewhat high of middle stature a wise man and of good understanding but that drew most the might from under him his niggardliness and money greed he had to wife ragna the daughter of nicholas mew king ingi was of all men the goodliest of face he had yellow hair somewhat thin and much curled slow of growth he was and scarce might he go alone so was his one leg wizen and crooked he was both of back and breast he was soft-spoken and kind toward his friends bounteous of wealth and let much the chief men rule with him the land matters well beloved of all folk was he and all these things together drew much under him of might and multitude brigida hight the daughter of king harold gilly she was first given to ingi the son of halstein the swede king and sithens to earl carl sonnison and then to magnus the swede king he and king ingi haroldson were sons of the same mother last earl burgir brosa had her to wife and they had four sons one was earl philip another earl canute the third folki the fourth magnus their daughters were ingigerd whom sorkvir the swede king had to wife and their son was king john another daughter was kristen a third margaret maria was the name of the second daughter of harold gilly and her simon sheath the son of hall kell hunch had to wife their son hight nicholas 
a third daughter of harold gillie was called margaret and her john the son of hall kell the brother of simon had to wife now betid many things betwixt these brethren which made toward dissension but i shall only set forth that which to me seemeth the most of tidings chapter twenty three cardinal nicholas cometh to norway cardinal nicholas out of rome town came to norway in the days of the sons of harold and the pope had sent him to norway now the cardinal had wrath against the brothers sigurd and eystein and they had to come to terms of peace with him but he was exceeding friendly towards ingi and called him his son and when they were all at peace with him he granted to them to hallow john burgesson archbishop of thrandheim and fetched him that raiment which hight pallium and laid down that there should be an archbishop's chair at nidois at christ church whereas rests king olaf the holy but before that time there had been load bishops only in norway the cardinal brought it about that no man should fare with weapons in cheaping steads sackless save the twelve men who had the following of the king he bettered in many things the custom of men in norway while he was there in the land never has outland man come to norway whom all men worshipped so mickle or who might prevail so much with the all folk as he sithens fared he south with a many of friendly gifts and said he would always be the greatest friend of the northmen but when he came south to romeburg the pope who had been before died suddenly and all folk of romeburg would have nicholas to pope then was he hallowed to pope with the name of adrianus so say those men who in his days came to romeburg that never had he so busy an errand with other men that he spake not first ever with the northmen who would have his speech he was not long pope and he is called holy chapter twenty four king olaf's miracles in the days of the sons of harold gilly it came to pass that a man who is named halder came across wens and they took him and pined him sheared his throat and drew there out his tongue and sheared it off to the tongue root sithens sought he to the holy king olaf and set his heart fast toward that holy man and prayed much greeting to king olaf to give him speech and health thereupon he gat speech and mercy from this good king and became straightway his servant all his life days and became a man of worship troth fast this miracle was half a month before the latter olaf mass on the day when cardinal nicholas landed chapter twenty five miracle of king olaf with richard the priest there were two brothers in the uplands men of high kin and well for wealth they were the sons of guthorm greybeard and were called einar and andreas the mother's brethren of king sigurd haraldson and had in those parts their heritage and all their goods they had a sister somewhat goodly to look to but never too wary of the words of evil men as was proven sithens she had mickle kindness for a certain english priest hight richard who had his home with her brethren she did many things to please him and off mickle good for goodwill's sake as ill luck would have it about this woman fared and flew a fearful word sithens when it was a matter of common talk then all men laid it on the hands of the priest her brothers among the rest for straightway when they were ware thereof they took it that all folk held him to be the likeliest hereto seeing what great kindness there was between these befell to them sithens mickle misfortune as was not unlike since they held their peace over a hidden guile and went on as if they saw naught therein now one day they called the priest to them and he looking from them for naught save good alone they drew him from home with them and said they were going into another countryside on some business they had on hand there and bade him keep them 
company thither they had with them a home man of theirs who wadded of this reed along with them they fared a shipboard along the water which is called rand and forth beside the strand thereof until they came to the ness which is called shifsand where they went ashore and played there a while thence they fared into a certain lonely stead and then they bade the workman smite him with an axe hammer and he smote the priest so that he lay in a swoon but when he gat his wit again he spake why shall i now be so hard dealt with they answered though no one tell thee thou shalt now find out what thou hast done and then they set their charges forth against him he gainsaid them and bade god judge between them and the holy king olaf thereupon they broke in sunder his legs and then dragged him between them into the wood and bound his hands behind his back thereafter they laid a string about his head and a board under his back and head and put a turnstick therein and twisted the string hard at the head then einar took a peg and set it against the eye of the priest and his servant stood there over and smote at it with an axe and let leap out the eye so that forthwith it leaped down into his beard then he set the peg against the other eye and said to the servant strike a deal softer now he did so and the peg glanced off the eyeball and tore the lid away from it then einar took the lid with his hand and held it up away from the eyeball and saw that it was there then he set the peg down out by the cheek and the servant struck and the eyeball sprang out unto the cheekbone where it was highest then they opened his mouth and seized the tongue and drew it out and sheared it off and thereafter they loosed his hands and head forthwith when he got wit again that was the first thing for him that he laid the eyeballs in their place up against the eyebrows and held them with both hands as he might sithens they bore him aboard ship and went to the homestead hight sea home dern and landed there they sent a man to the stead to tell them that the priest lay by the ship there on the strand while the man was gone up who was sent they asked if the priest might speak but he wagged the tongue and would try to speak then spake einar to his brother if he come round and the stump of the tongue heal up it comes into my mind that he will speak then they caught the stump of the tongue with tongs and tugged it and sheared off it twice and a third time they cut at the roots of the tongue and left him lying there half dead the housewife at the stead was poor yet she went forth with and her daughter with her and bore him home to the house in their cloaks sithens fared they to fetch a priest and when he came there he bound all his wounds and they sought for him such easements as they might the wounded priest lay thus in piteous plight he hoped ever for god's mercy and never doubted it and speechless he prayed to god in his thought and his grief-filled heart all the more trustfully the sicker he was and he turned his mind to that merciful king olaf the holy god's darling and had heard erst much said of his glorious deeds and therefore trode all the swiftlier in him in his whole heart for all help in his need and as he lay there lamed and bereft of all strength he greeted sorely and groaned and prayed from a sore breast to the dearling king olaf to avail him now after midnight the wounded priest fell asleep and thought that he saw a noble-looking man come to him and speak to him ill art thou now played with fellow richard i see that now naught mickle art thou of might and he thought he said that was true then this one said to him in need of mercy thou art the priest said i am in need of the mercy of god almighty and of king olaf the holy he answered and thou shalt have it withal then he caught hold on the stump of the tongue and hauled it so hard that the priest smarted thereat then next he stroked his hand over his eyes and his legs and whatever of his limbs were sore then the priest 
asked who this was and he looked towards the priest and said olaf is here from the north out of frandheim and therewith he vanished away but the priest awoke all whole and forthwith he fell to speak blessed am i now said he thanks to god and the holy king olaf who hath healed me and now grievously as he had been played with before even so speedily was he healed of all that mishap and it seemed to him as if he had never been sore nor sick the tongue whole both eyes duly set in the head the broken legs healed all other hurts whole or free from pain he in the very best of health but for a token that his eyes had been stung out was this that on either eyelid there grew a white scar that the glory of that noble king might be seen in the man that once had been put into so piteous a plight chapter twenty six the kings take counsel together eystein and sigurd had fallen out whereas king sigurd had slain a bodyguard of king eystein herald of the wick to wit who had a house in bjorgvin and another man withal priest john tabard a son of biarni sigurdson for this sake they appointed a peace meeting between them in winter in the uplands they sat long a-talking together they two alone and there afterwards it came out of their talk that they should meet all the brothers the next summer in bjorgvin that followed their talk that they would that king ingi had two manors or three and so much of other wealth that he might have thirty men with him for they gave out how they thought he had no health to be a king ingi and gregory heard these tidings and fared to bjornvid with much folk sigurd came there a little later and had with him folk clearly lesser now by then had ingi and sigurd been kings over norway for nineteen winters eystein was later from the east out of the wick than they were from the north then let king ingi blow for a thing in the home and thither come king sigurd and king ingi and much folk gregory had two long ships and upwards of nine tens of men whom he found in all victuals he kept his housecarls better than other landed men in that he drank never in any guild that his housecarls drank not all with him he went to the thing in gold reddened helm and all his company was behelmed so king ingi stood up and told men of what he had heard how his brothers were minded to deal with him and bad for help for him and all the all folk made good cheer to his speech and said they would follow him chapter twenty seven of gregory dason then king sigurd stood up and spake and said that it was unsooth what king ingi laid at their door said that gregory had made it up and quoth that it would be no long while if he might have his will till such a meeting of them should be as he would therein make to stoop that gold reddened helm and such wise he closed his speech that he quoth that they two should not be both a ganging long gregory answered and said he was minded to think that he needed little to yearn for that and gave out that he was all ready for it a few days after a housecarl of gregory was slain out of doors in the street and it was a housecarl of king sigurd's who slew him then would gregory set upon king sigurd and his but king ingi led it and many other men but when as ingerid the mother of king ingi was going from evensong she came there where sigurd god axe lay slain he was of king ingi's bodyguard and was an old man and had been in the service of many kings but the slayers were two of king sigurd's bodyguard hallward gnarson and sigurd son of eystein travail and men laid the reed on king sigurd then went she straight to king ingi and told him and said long would he be a little king if he would not bestir him though his own guards were slain one after the other as swine the king was wroth at her taunts and while they were bickering together came gregory walking in helmed and burnied and bade the king not be wroth and said that she spoke sooth i have come here to help thee up if thou wilt set on king sigurd and here is more than one hundred of men out in the garth of my house carls helmed and burnied and we shall set upon them thence 
whereas others deem it worst but most letted this and said that king sigurd would have will to boot this unhap but when gregory saw that there would be hanging back then spake he with king ingi such wise are they lopping off thee that a short while ago they slew me a housecarl and now a courtman of thee but they will be longing to catch me or some other landed man such as them seemeth would be the greatest lack for thee for they see that thou bestirrest thyself not and then to take thee from thy kingdom after that thy friends be slain now whatso way thine other landed men may will i will not abide the neat's stroke and we two sigurd and i shall deal together this night whatsoever the bargain may be but as for thee thou art both ill bestead by reason of thine ill health and moreover i am minded to think thou hast but little will to uphold thy friends but now am i all bound to go hence to meet sigurd for here without is my banner king ingi stood up and called for his clothes and bade every man array himself who would follow him and said that it would not avail to let him for that he had backed water long enough but now must there needs be a filing down to the steel betwixt them chapter twenty eight the fall of king sigurd king sigurd drank in the garth of sigurd Sida, and made ready but was minded that there would be no onset but sithence they set upon the garth king ingi down from the smith's booths arni king's stepfather west from sandbridge aslak erlinson from his own garth but gregory from the street and it was deemed worst thence sigurd and his shot much from out the loft windows and break them up ovens and hove the stones upon them gregory and his broke open the garth gate and there in the gate fell einar the son of lax paul out of king sigurd's folk and hallward gunnarson who was shot in the loft and no man grieved for him they hewed the house and king sigurd's folk went from his hand and to peace then went sigurd into a certain loft and would crave silence for him but he had a gold reddened shield and men knew him and would not hearken him but shot at him so that it was as looking into the snowdrift and so there he might not be but when his folk had gone from his hand and men hewed the houses much then went he out and with him thord housewife his courtman a man out of wick and with thither whereas was king ingi before them and sigurd called to ingi his brother that he should give him peace but they were straightway hewn both of them fell thord housewife much befamed there fell many men though few i name of sigurd's folk and ingi's withal and four men of the band of gregory and they withal who were on neither side and were in the way of shot either down on the bridges or out aboard the ships they fought fourteen nights before the mass of john baptist and the day was friday king sigurd was buried at christ church the ancient out on the home king ingi gave to gregory the ship which king sigurd had owned but two nights or three after king eystein came with thirty ships from the east and had their hakon his brother's son a faring with him and he fared not to Bjorgvin, but tarried at florabites and men went between and would appease them but gregory would that they should put off and set upon them and said that it would be no better later and that he would be captain therein but thou king fare not there is now no lack of folk but many letted this wherefore the onset came not off king eystein went east into the wick and king ingi north into thrandheim and they were now at peace so to say yet they themselves met not chapter twenty nine of gregory dason gregory dason went east a little later than king eystein and stayed up in hofund at brentburg his stead king eystein was up at oslo and let his ships be dragged more than two sea miles over ice for ice lay much in the wick he fared up into hofund and was minded to lay hands on gregory but he was ware thereof and fared away with ninety men up into thelmark and there north over the fell and came down in hard anger 
and fared thence to studley in edney where as erling askew had a stead he was gone from home to Bjorgvin, but christen his wife the daughter of king sigurd was at home and offered to gregory whatever he would have thence and there gat gregory good cheer he had thence a long ship which erling owned and all that he needed gregory thanked her well and said she had done after the fashion of a great lady as might be looked for but sithence they fared to Bjorgvin and found erling and him thought she had done well chapter thirty peace between kings ingi and eystein thereupon gregory dason went north to cheaping and came there before yule king ingi was most fain of him and bade him have of his whatsoever he would king eystein burned the stead of gregory and hewed down his beasts but the ship sheds which king eystein the older had let do north in cheaping and which were the best of good things were burned in the winter together with good ships with all which king ingi owned and that deed was most ill befriended and the reed thereof was ken to king eystein and philip son of gerd the foster brother of king sigurd the next summer fared king ingi from the north and became full many manned but king eystein fared from the east and he also gathered folk to him they met in seal isles north of lidendisness and king ingi was much the most manned they were then on the very point of coming to blows but they made peace on the terms that eystein should handsell to pay five and forty marks of gold and ingi should have thereof thirty marks whereas eystein had had a hand in the ship burning as well as the shed burning but philip should be outlaw and all they withal who had been at the burning when the ships were burnt those men should also be outlaws who were proven to have given wounds to king sigurd for king eystein charged king ingi with upholding those men but gregory should have fifteen marks for that which king eystein had burnt up for him king eystein misliked this and deemed it a peace under stress king ingi fared east into the wick from the moat and eystein north into thrandheim sithence was king ingi in the wick and king eystein away in the north and they met not and those words only fared between them which were naught for peace moreover each let slay the other's friends and there was no paying of the fine from eystein's hand and each witted the other that he held not to that which had been settled king ingi he and gregory weaned much people away from king eystein bard stantail the son of berniolf to wit and simon's sheaf the son of halkel hunch and many other landed men as haldor the son of berniolf and john son of halkel chapter thirty one of king ingi and eystein but when two winters were worn from the death of king sigurd the kings drew hosts together ingi from the east of the land and he got eighty ships and king eystein from the north and he fetched five and forty ships then had he the great dragon which king eystein son of magnus had let do and an all fair host they had and a mickle king ingi lay with his ships south by mostile but king eystein a little farther to the north in greening sound king eystein sent south to king ingi aslak the young son of john and arni stour the son of seabare and they had one ship but when the men of ingi kenned them they laid to them and slew many of their men and seized the ship with all there was on it and all their baggage but aslak and arni and some men with them got away upland and fared to find king eystein and told him what welcome king ingi had given them so king eystein held a husting and told his men what unpeace ingi and his would do them and bade his host to follow him for we have an host so mickle and good that i will flee no whither away if ye will follow me but there was no cheer at his speaking halkel hunch was there but both his sons simon and john were with king ingi so halkel answered so that a very many heard let thy gold chests follow thee now and let them ward thy land chapter thirty two how king eystein lost his life the night after they rode away in many ships stealthily some into fellowship with king ingi some to bjornvin 
some into the firths but in the morning when it was light there was the king left with but ten ships then he left behind there the great dragon whereas it was heavy under oars and more of the ships withal and they hewed the dragon much and withal their ale vats they hewed down and whatsoever they might not bring away with them they spoilt king eystein went aboard the ship of eindrid the son of john suetneb and they fared north and in to sagan and thence by overland ways east into wick king ingi took the ships and fared by the seaway east into wick but on the eastern shore of the fold there was king eystein and had well nigh twelve hundreds of men then saw they the ship host of king ingi and deemed they had not folk enough thereto and so ran away into the wood they fled each one his own way so that the king was left with but one man king ingi and his were ware of the fairings of king eystein and withal that he was but a few and they fared to seek him simon's sheath hit upon him as he went from out of a certain thicket against them simon greeted him hail loafward said he the king answered i wot not but that thou deemest thyself now my loafward said he that is now as it may turn out said simon the king prayed him to get him off saying it behooved him for it has long been well between us though now it be another way simon said that at this time that would come to naught the king prayed he might be hearkened mass first and that was done thereupon he lay adown grovelling and stretched his arms out from him and prayed to hew him crossways between his shoulders and said that then it would be proven whether he would foal iron or not as they had said those fellows of king ingi simon spake to him who should hew him and bade him fall to and quoth that the king had crept about the ling there over long then was he hewn and was deemed to have done valiantly his body was brought to force but his corpse was waked to the south of the church beneath the brent king eystein was laid in earth at force church and his lying place is in the middle of the floor and a rug is spread thereover and men call him holy there where he was hewed and his blood came on the earth sprang up a well and another there under the brent where his body was waked from either water many men deem they have got healing it is the saying of the wick folk that many miracles befell at the tomb of king eystein ere his unfriends cast on his tomb the broth of a sodden dog simon's sheath gat the most unthank for this deed and that was the talk of all the commonalty but some said that when king eystein was taken simon sent a man to meet king ingi and that the king bade eystein not to come in his eyesight so has king sverer let write it but einar son of scully says thus will the much evil simon the sheath the want to murder the king's bereer hereafter be saved despite of such deeds end of the story of ingi son of harold and his brethren part three chapter twenty two through thirty two section seventy two of heimskringla by snorri sturleson translated by george pope morris and iriker magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of hakon shoulder broad part one chapter one through ten chapter one the beginnings of hakon shoulder broad hakon the son of king sigurd was taken for head of the flock which had erst followed king eystein and the flockmen gave him the king's name then was he of ten winters there were then with him these sigurd the son of hallward freeholder of rayer and andreas and onan the sons of simon and foster brothers of hakon and many other chieftains and friends of kings eystein and sigurd they fared first up into goutland king ingi cast his owning over all that which they had in norway and made them outlaws king ingi fared north into wick and dwelt there 
that wilds north in the land gregory sat at king's rock in the way of the peril and warded the land there chapter two of gregory day's son next summer hakon and his came down from goutland and came to king's rock and had a right mickle host and fair gregory was as then in the town and called together a thronged thing of bonders and by men and craved aid of them he deemed the men gave little cheer to this and gave out that he trusted them ill so he fared away with two ships into the wick and was all unglad he was minded to go and meet king ingi for he had heard that king ingi fared with a mickle host from the north round the wick but when gregory was gone but a short way towards the north he came upon simon sheath and haldor the son of berneoff and gerd the son of amundi king ingi's foster-brother gregory was much fain of them and he turned back and all they together and had eleven ships but when they rode into king's rock hakon and his were holding a thing outside the town and saw their faring then said sigurd of rare now is gregory fay since he fareth into our hands with few folk gregory laid to land right before the town and would abide king ingi for he was to be looked for yet he came not king hakon got ready in the town and let thorliot brush skull be at the head of that host which was aboard the merchant ships that floated off the town he was a viking and a robber but hakon and sigurd and the main host was in the town and drew up on the bridges all men there had gone under hakon chapter three the flight of king hakon gregory and his rode up along the river and let the ships drift down the stream upon thurliot and his for a while they shot at each other until thorliot sprang overboard and his fellows and some were slain but others some came aland then gregory and his rode to the bridges and straightway gregory let shoot up bridges from his ship under the feet of hakon's men then fell the man who bore his banner whom he told off for going up then gregory bade hall the son of audun the son of hall to take up the banner and he did so and carried the banner up on to the bridges but gregory went up straightway after him and shoved forth a shield over his head but forthwith when gregory came upon the bridges and hakon's men knew him they fell back and gave way on either side but when more of the host came up from the ships gregory and his men sought forward and hakon's men at first shrank aback and then ran away up into the town but gregory and his men followed them up and drave them twice out of the town and slew many no faring was more valiant than this by the speech of men which gregory fared whereas hakon had more than forty hundreds of men and gregory not full four hundreds then spake gregory to hall son of audun after the battle many men do i find lither in onset than you icelanders for ye are more on want than we norway men but no men do i find more weapon bold than ye be then a little later king ingi came in and let slay many men who had taken to hakon some he let pay fines but for some he burned the steads but others some he drove out of the land and did to them much ill hakon fled away up into goutland but the next winter he went over land north into thrandheim and came there before easter and the thrand folk took him for king to his father's heritage one-third of norway to wit against king ingi ingi and gregory were in the wick and gregory would fare north and set upon them but many letted it and that winter it came to naught chapter four the slaying of gerd and howard hakon fared from the north in the spring and had well nigh thirty ships the wick folk out of hakon's host fared before with eight ships and harried in both mirrors no man called to mind that there 
had ever been any harrying between the two cheapings john son of halkell hunch gathered a bonder host and set upon them and took colbine the wood and slew every man's child aboard his ship then he went in search of the others and came upon them with their seven ships and they fought but halkell his father did not go to meet him as had been bespoken between them there fell a many of good bonders and he was wounded himself hakon fared south to bjorgvin with his band and when they came to stiorn velta they heard that king ingi had already come from the east a few nights before he and gregory to bjorgvin so they durst not hold on thitherward they sailed past bjorgvin by the outer way and came upon some of king ingi's following on three ships which had been belated from the east there was gerd the son of amundi king ingi's foster-brother he had for wife girid the sister of gregory another was gerd the lawman son of gunhild the third was howard butterbread hakon let slay gerd the son of amundi as well as howard butterbread but gerd the lawman he had with him and fared east into the wick chapter five of counsels but when king ingi heard that he went east after them and they met east in the elf king ingi put into the river up along the northernmost branch and made spying before him about hakon and his but king ingi laid to land out by hissing and there abode the spies but when they came back they went to the king and said they had seen king hakon's host and all the array thereof said that they were lying up by the stakes and had moored their sterns to the stakes they have two east-faring keels and have laid them outermost of all the ships on these keels are masthead castles and castles withal in the prow of both but when the king heard that what array they had he let blow all his host to a husting but when the thing was called and set then sought the king reed of his host and calls thereto on gregory day son and erling askew his brother-in-law and other landed men and captains of ships and tells them all the array of hakon's men gregory answered first and made his will clear and said the meeting of hakon and me has befallen sundry times and they have oftenest had the more host and yet had the lesser part in our dealings but now have we by far the greater host and it will now seem likely to those who lately have missed noble kinsmen from them that here will vengeance bear up well whereas they have long been drifting about before us this summer and we have often spoken that if they would but abide us as now it is said they have done then would we venture on a meeting with them now that have i to say of my mind that i will pitch the battle against them if that be not against the king's will for that i am yet minded to think as hath been before that they will now have to give way if we set upon them keenly and i shall take upon me the onset there where other men deem it hardest at the word of gregory was mickle cheer and all men gave out they were ready to give battle to hakon and his then all the ships were rowed up along the river until each side saw the other then king ingi and his sidled out of the river stream up under the island then the king had talked with all his captains and bade them array for onset and charged erling askew therewith saying as was sooth that there was not a wiser man nor keener in battle in that host though some might be more heady than he and the king turned his speech to yet more landed men and named some by name but so closed he his speech that he bade each to set forth what he saw would avail in reed and after that to be all at one chapter six the answer and counsel of erling askew erling askew answered the speech of the king bound am i o king not to be silent at thy speech and if thou wilt wot what my counsel will be then shall i let thee hear it the plan which now has been set is straight contrary to my mind for i call this a sheer peril to fight with them as things now stand though we have an host mickle and fair if we shall give them the onfall and row against this river stream whereas there are three men in each half room there will be one to row and the second to shield him what then beyond one-third of our host is left for doing the fighting 
it seems to me unfightful will they do in the battle who are at the oars and turn their backs toward our unfriends give me leisure for taking counsel but i promise in return that i shall find a reed before three days be worn whereby easier we may bring about an onset on them and in erling's speech it was much found that he leaded the onset but no less there were many who egged the onset and said that hakon and his would now run ashore once again as before and so we get nothing of them they said but now they have but a scanty company and we have all their reed in our hand gregory spake but few words on the matter but made such taunt as seemed to say that erling's chief reason went much hereto in letting the onset that he would undo the reed which gregory had set forth rather than that he knew how to see more clearly through this matter than all others chapter seven of king hakon's host then king ingi spake to erling brother-in-law said he now will we follow out thy counsel as to how the onset shall be arrayed but since the captains will rather have it so we shall fall upon them even to-day then said erling all cutters and light craft shall row out round the island and then up the eastern outlet and thus come down upon them and try to loose them from the stakes but then we shall row in upon them in the big ships and it is not known till it be tried whether they the captains shall make by as much a better onset than i as they be wilder for it this reed was well liking to all a certain ness stretched out between the host of king ingi and hakon and neither saw the other's ships but when the host of the cutters came rowing down the river that saw hakon and his folk but before they had been at a talking for doing their reed some guessed that king ingi and his would fall on but many were minded to think that they would not brave it seeing that the onfall seemed to be much tarried but they trusted well in their array and their host in their flock there were many great men there was sigurd of rayer and the two sons of simon there too was nicholas the son of skialdvor and eindrid the son of john Swetneb, who was the most renowned and best befriended man in the folklands of Thrandheim and many other landed men and captains of companies were there now when they saw that the men of ingi came rowing down along the river with many ships hakon and his thought that ingi with his host was minded to flee and so hewed the moorings of their vessels and fell to their oars and rowed after them and would drive them the ships drove fast down before the stream and as they bore down along the river past the ness which before was betwixt them they saw that the main host of ingi lay down by the island of hissing ingi's fellows saw where fared the ships of hakon and deemed that they would fall on so there arose a great bustle and clatter of weapons and eggings on and therewithal they broke out into the war-whoop but thereat hakon and his turned their ships towards the northern shore where there was a certain sheltering creek and thus they got out of the stream there they arrayed them and bore stern moorings ashore and turned outwards the prows of all their ships and lashed all the ships together and let the east-faring hulks lie out away from the other ships one up above the other nether and lashed them to the long ships but in the midst of the fleet lay the king's ship and next to it sigurd's ship and on the other board of the king's ship lay nicholas and next to him eindrid the son of john all the smaller ships lay outwater they had loaded well nigh all their ships with stones and weapons chapter eight the speech of sigurd of rayer sigurd of rayer spoke and said it is now to be looked for that the meeting between us and king ingi which has been long promised this summer will now come to pass now we have been making ready for it much long and many of our fellows have blustered greatly that they would not flee nor falter before king ingi or gregory and it is now well to call such words to mind but we may with less assurance speak hereof whereas erst we have got somewhat too sore in our dealings for it is so even as every one hath heard that much oft we have fared floundering before them none the less we are now bound to meet them at our manliest and to withstand them at our fastest for only that way out have we forgetting of the victory now although we have an host somewhat fewer than they yet may weird rule it which shall have the gain and that is the best hope in our case that god wotteth 
that we have right on our side ingi has already hewn down his two brethren and no man is so blind as not to see what father booting is minded for king hakon to wit to hew him down as his other kinsmen and that will be seen to-day from the beginning hakon craved no more of norway than the ridding his father had had and that was gainsaid him but in my esteem hakon hath a better title to inheritance after eystein his father's brother than ingi or simon sheath or any others of the men who reft king eystein of his life many a one would so look to it who would save his soul and had such like big ill deeds on his hands as has ingi that he would not dare before god to be called by a king's name and that i wonder that god foleth of him that overboldness and that will be god's will that we hurl him down fight we boldly then for god will give us the victory but if we fall god will reward us with manifold joy therefore if he lend power to evil men to overcome us let men fare steadily and falter not if battle befall let each one heed himself and those of his company and god all of us good cheer was given to the speech of sigurd and all well behight to do their best king hakon went aboard one of the east faring hulks and there was set a shieldberg about him but his banner was on the long ship whereon he had been hitherto chapter nine of the men of king ingi now we have to tell of the men of king ingi how when they saw that those of hakon arrayed them for battle and but the river was between them they sent a swift faring craft out after their host which had rowed away bidding them to turn back and the king with the rest of his host abode them and arrayed them for the onset spake the captains and told to the host their forecast firstly which of the ships should lie nearest and then where each one should fall on gregory said we have a great host and a goodly now it is my counsel that thou king be not in the onset for then is all heeded when thou art heeded and none wotteth where a misshot arrow may stray they have such a ray that from out of the masthead castles will be cast stones and shot and that is but little less risk to them who be farther they have got no more folk than what is handy for us landed men to hold battle withal i shall lay my ship against that ship of theirs which is most and i ween still that it will be but a short trial to fight with them so oftest it has been at our meetings although another way have been the odds than now twas well liking to all what gregory spake that the king should not himself be in the battle then spake erling ask you that reed will i follow that thou king fare not into the battle so meseemeth of their arrayal that we must needs pay good heed if we get not great man time of them and meseemeth it best to bind up all safe as to the reed which we had earlier in the day many spake against that which i reeded and said that i had no will to fight but now meseems things have turned about much handier for us seeing that they are already away from the stakes and now things have so come about that naught shall i let giving battle for i see that which all men wot how great the need is to scatter this flock of evil-doers which has fared about all the land with robbery and rifling for men thereafter might dwell in the land in peace and serve one only king and that such a good and right wise one as is king ingi who has already long enough had toil and trouble from the insolence and iniquity of his kinsmen and been the breast before all the all folk and laid himself into manifold risk in giving peace to the land many things erling spake and deftly and yet more headmen besides and it all came down to one place that they all egged the onset they abode the gathering of all their host king ingi then had the beach board and he yielded to the prayer of his friends that he did not go into the battle but lay behind by the island chapter ten the beginning of the battle now when the host was ready they fall to the on rowing and both sides set up the war-whoop ingi's men lashed not their ships together and fared on close serried for they had to row right athwart the stream and it much swept the big ships erling askew set upon the ship of king hakon and shoved his prow in betwixt it and sigurd's ship and then befell the battle 
but the ship of gregory was swept aground and heeled over much so at first they gat them not into the onset and when hakon's men saw this they laid to on them and fell on but gregory's ship lay before them then laid there too ivar the son of hakon maw and the poops of both ships drifted together ivar hooked a grapnel round gregory where he was slenderest and hauled him towards him and gregory swerved out towards the board and the grapnel swept up along the flank of him and ivar was on the very point of hooking him overboard gregory was but little hurt whereas he had a plate burning ivar called to him and said that he was thick boarded gregory answered and said that ivar was so doing with him that needful was that with naught to spare then things had come to such a pass that gregory and his were at point to go overboard till aslak the young got an anchor aboard their ship and drew them off the ground then gregory set on ivar's ship and they had to do together a long while and gregory's ship was the bigger and more manned fell much folk on ivar's ship but some leaped overboard ivar was much hurt so that he was not fight worthy but when his ship was ridded gregory let flit him a land and got him off and ever after they were friends end of the story of hakon shoulder broad part one chapter one through ten section seventy three of heims kringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and ira kurt magnuson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of hakon shoulder broad part two chapter eleven through twenty one chapter eleven the flight of king hakon but when king ingi and his fellows saw that gregory was aground the king cried on his men to row there too he said it was the unwisest reed that we should lie behind here and our friends fare to battle we have that ship which is the most and best manned of the whole host and now i see that gregory needeth folk that man whom i have best to reward so lay we into battle at our hardest and that is rightest that i be in the battle for i will have the victory for mine own if it is to be gained but even if i knew beforehand that our men would have the foil yet would it be the one thing due for us to be there whereas the other men of ours should be for i may have no more furtherance if i miss those men who are my breast and are the briskest and long have been the four men for me and my realm then bade he set up the banners and they did so and rowed over the river then was the battle at its wildest and the king got no room for laying on so thronged lay the ships before him then lay they under the east faring hulk and there were borne down on them spears and pow staves and stones so great that naught might hold out against them and they could not abide there but when the host saw it that the king was come there they ridded a place for him and then he laid aboard the ship of eindred johnson then the men of hakon left the small ships and went up on to the hulks but some went aland erling askew and his men had a hard onset he was in the fore-room and called on his forecastle men and bade them go up on to the king's ship they answered that was not an easy matter for there were iron-bound timbers before them then erling went forth into the prow and tarried there but a little while or ever they boarded the king's ship and ridded that ship then took all the host to flee and after that many of them leaped into the deep and much folk fled away withal but all the throng gat them a land even as says einar the son of scully in the deep fell men a many from the gory boughs of sea steeds enough meat gat the troll's steed before the stream drave corpses elf bitter cold was reddened with the hot flood of wounding 
warm ale of wolf with water fell into the belt of cormped isle a many ships prow bloody in the swift mouth of river drave empty there the war-host was swaying of the elm bough gainst dank helms flew the red steel ere fled the host of captains aground from sea deer scant grew the hakon's host in shield roar einar wrought on gregory the son of day a flock which is called the elf staves king ingi gave peace to nicholas the son of skialvor when his ship was ridded and then he went unto king ingi and was with him sithence whilst he lived eindred the son of john when his ship was cleared leaped over into king ingi's ship and craved life and limb the king was of will to give him life but the son of howard butterbread ran to him and hewed him his bane blow and that work was much blamed but he said that eindred had reeded the slaying of his father howard eindred was much bewailed yet most of all within the lands of thrandheim there fell a many of hakon's host but no more captains few men fell out of the host of king ingi but many were wounded hakon fled up inland but ingi fared north into the wick with his host and was in the wick the winter over and gregory withal but when from this fight came to Bjorgvin those men of king ingi bergliot and his brethren the sons of ivar of elda they slew nicholas beard a rent master that had been and thereupon went home north to thrandheim king hakon came north before yule but sigurd was whiles at home at rare gregory had taken pledge of king ingi for him that he should have all his possessions for they were close akin sigurd and gregory king hakon was in cheeping through the yule and one evening early in the yule tide his men got to blows in the court hall and eight men came by their death and many were wounded but after the eighth day of yule there fared into elda these fellows of hakon alf the ruffian the son of otar breitling and well nigh eighty men and they came there unawares in early night when the others were drunk and set fire to the house and they went out and fought for life but there fell burgliot ivor's son and ogmund his brother and a very many of men well nigh thirty had there been there within that winter there died in cheeping north andreas the son of simon the foster brother of king hakon and was sore bewailed erling askew and the men of king ingi they who were in bjorgvin gave out that they would fare north now or then that winter to take hakon but it came to naught gregory sent such words from the east from king's rock as that if he sat as nigh as was erling and his he would not sit quiet in bjorgvin if hakon were letting slay the friends of king ingi in thrandheim and their fellows-in-law chapter twelve fight on the bridges king ingi and gregory fared in spring from the east unto bjorgvin but as soon as hakon and sigurd heard that king ingi was fared from the wick they went east by the overland ways into the wick now when as king ingi and his came to bjorgvin there arose dissension between haldor berniofsen and bjorn nicholson a house carl of bjorn when they met down on the bridges asked why the other was so pale but he said he had been let blood i would not by bloodletting be so bleak of face as thou art but methinks quoth the other that thou wouldst be likely to take it much worse and more cowardly now the beginning was no more than so then waxed word on word until they strove and thereupon fell to fighting then it was told to haldor 
berniolfsen that his house carl had been wounded on the bridges but haldor was drinking thereby in the garth and went thither but erst were come the house carls of bjorn and halder deemed they had parted in an uneven manner so they shoved the house carls of bjorn and knocked them about then was it told to bjorn buck that the wick whites were beating his house carls down on the bridges then bjorn and his took their weapons and went thither and would avenge their men then was wounding betwixt them then was told gregory that haldor his kinsman-in-law needed help and that his house calls were being hewed down out in the open street then gregory and his ran to their burnies and fared there too that heard erling askew that bjorn his sister's son was fighting with haldor and gregory on the bridges of town and that he needed help so he went thither much manned and bad men lend him help saying it were a shame to men if one wick man is to walk over us here in our kin hay for that would be brought up against us for ever and ever there fell fourteen men and nine had their bane straightway but five died from wounds sithens but many men were hurt then the word came to king ingi that they were fighting up town on the bridges gregory and erling so he went thither and would part them but might bring nothing about so mad as were both sides then gregory called out to king ingi and bade him keep aloof saying he might bring nothing about as matters then stood and said that were the greatest scathe if anything should befall him whereas none may wot where he may be who would not spare himself that mishap if he but deemed it might bechance him then the king fared away now when the most turmoil dried up gregory and his went up to nicholas church and erling and his after them and then they called out on each other then came again king ingi and appeased them and then both sides would that he alone should do the award between them then heard they that hakon was in the wick and king ingi and gregory went east and had very many ships but when they came east hakon and his fled away and there was no battle so king ingi went up to oslo but gregory was at king's rock chapter thirteen the slaying of munan gregory heard a little later of the whereabouts of king hakon and his that they were in there where is height sour byers which lieth up against the wild wood he fared thither and came a night-time and thought that hakon and sigurd would be at the bigger of the two steads and there they set fire to the houses but hakon and his were at the lesser stead and came over when they saw the fire and would lend help to the others there fell munan the son of ali the unsconed and brother to king sigurd the father of hakon gregory and his slew him when he would to come to the aid of those who were burnt within but they went out and a many of men were slain there asbjorn mare got away from the stead he was the greatest viking and was wounded a certain bonder met him and asbjorn prayed the bonder to let him off and said he would pay him money therefore the bonder said he would do that which was more to his mind said he had often gone in fear of him so he hewed him his bane blow hakon and sigurd got away but much of their folk was slain thereafter gregory went east to king's rock a little later hakon and sigurd went to the manor of haldor son of berniolf of vetland and set fire to the houses and burnt them haldor went out of doors and was hewn forthwith and his housecarls with him and there were slain nigh twenty men in all sigrid his wife was the sister of gregory and here they let go away to the wood in night sark alone there they took amundi the son of gerd amundison and of girid the daughter of day he was a sister's son of gregory and they brought him away with them he was then of five winters chapter fourteen the fall of gregory 
gregory heard these tidings and deemed them great and he sought carefully into their whereabouts he went out of king's rock in the latter part of the yuletide with much folk and they came to force on the thirteenth day of yule he stayed there for the night and went to matins there on the last day of yule and the gospel was read to him thereafter this was on a bath day and when gregory and his saw the host of hakon they deemed hakon's folk much less than their own a certain river there was between them where they met and which height bethia the ice was ill on the river whereas the flood-tide went up from without under the ice hakon and his had cut wakes on the river and had shoveled snow thereon so nothing might be seen thereof when gregory came to the river he said that him seemed that the ice was ill to cross and said that it were reed to fare to a bridge which was a little higher up across the river the bonder host answered and said that they wotted not what was the matter that he should not dare to seek to them across the ice no more of folk being against them they would have it that the ice was good enough and said they deemed he was luck forsaken gregory answers and says that seldom had there been need of taunting him much for lack of heart and said that should not be needed even now and he bade them follow him well and not stand on land if he go out upon the ice and said it was their reed to cross an evil ice and that therefore he was uneager but i will not sit under your taunt said he and bade bear forth his banner so he went out on to the ice with his folk but straightway when as the bonder company found the ice was bad then turned aback the host of them gregory sank through the ice yet not much so he bade his men be wary but no more went after him than about twenty men but the rest of the folk turned back a man in hakon's flock shot an arrow to him and smote him under the throat of him there fell gregory and ten men with him and there now is the close of his lifetime it is all folks say that he was the most chieftain of the landed men of norway in the memory of the men who then were alive and best he was to us icelanders since king eystein the older died the body of gregory was flitted up into hofund and was buried at jimsey at the nun's seat there then was Balguide, the sister of gregory abbas there chapter fifteen the king ingi hears of the fall of gregory two king's stewards fared with the tidings to tell king ingi thereof up at oslo and when they came they craved speech of the king he asked what tidings they told the fall of gregory day son said they how came about such ill hap said the king they told him the king answered then they ruled there who knew the worse so it is said that he took this so ill that he wept like a child but when that passed off he said this i will to fair find gregory straightway when i heard of the slaying of haldor for i deemed i knew well enough that gregory would not sit so long that he would not turn to avenging him but this folk went on as if nothing was so needful as this yule drinking and that might in no wise be given up now i know for sure that if i had been there things would have gone forward more readfully or we two else i and gregory would both have fared to one guesting but there is gone that man who has been the best to me and has most chiefly held the land in my hands and hitherto it has been my thought that short while would be between us now i shall undertake alone to go meet hakon and his and then it shall be either that i shall have my bane or else i shall stride over hakon but none the more avenged is such a man as was gregory though they all come for him a man answered and said that he would need to search but little for them and said they were minded thitherward to find him Kristen was there in oslo the daughter of king sigurd and brother's daughter of king ingi the king heard that she was minded to fare away from the town and sent word to her and asked why she would away from the town but she said she thought it was so full of uproar and that it was no abiding place for women the king prayed she should not fare away for if we gained the day as i am minded 
thou wilt then be well holden here but if i fall my friends will not get to dight my body yet shalt thou beseech that it be granted thee to lay out the dead and so mayest thou best reward me that i have been well with thee chapter sixteen of king ingi in the evening of blaze mass news came to king ingi that hakon was to be looked for at the town then king ingi let blow the host up out of the town and let array it and the tally thereof was well nigh forty hundreds of men the king let the rank be long and not more than five deep then spake men to king ingi that he should not be in the fight for on him they said there lay so much so let worm thy brother be lord over the host the king answers this i am minded to think that if gregory were alive here now and i were fallen and mine avenging were toward that he would not be lying in hiding places but would be in the battle himself now though i be in a worse plight than was he for my infirmity's sake yet i shall not be worse willed towards him and it is not to be looked for that i be not in the battle so men say that gunhild whom simon had had to wife the foster mother of hakon let sit out for victory to hakon but it showed out that they should fight with king ingi by night and never by day and said that that would do but thordis skegja is named the woman of whom is said that she sat out but the sooth thereof i wot not simon's sheaf had gone into the town and laid him down to sleep and he awoke with the war-whoop but as the night wore news came to king ingi and he was told that hakon and his were coming from without on to the ice but ice lay all the way from the town out to head isle chapter seventeen the talk of king ingi then went king ingi with his host out on to the ice and set his array before the town simon's sheaf was in the arm which looked towards thralsburg but in that arm which was in pass nun's seat was gudrod king of the south isles the son of olaf butterbread and john the son of svein the son of bergthor buck but when hakon and his came upon the array of king ingi either side whooped the war-whoop gudrod and john beckoned to hakon and his men to let them know where they stood before them and therewith hakon's men turned thither but gudrod and his fled straightway and that host might have been well nigh fifteen hundreds of men but john and a great company with him ran into the host of hakon and fought on their side this was told to king ingi and he answered thus wide apart have my friends been never had gregory so fared while he lived then spake men and bade the king that they should speedily shove a horse under him and that he should ride out of the battle and up into round realm for there wilt thou get plenteous help even to-day i have no mind thereto said the king oft i hear you say and sooth i deem it that little served to undo my brother eystein after he turned to flight and yet he was a man well endowed in everything that makes fair a king now can i see of my infirmity how little may undo me if i take up this counsel whereas he got so sorely entangled albeit so far asunder were his conditions from mine both as to health and all might i was then in my second winter when i was taken for king over norway and now i am well five-and-twenty meseems i have had more troubles and cares in my kingdom than pleasure and joy i have had many battles whiles with more folk whiles with less and that has been my greatest good luck that i have never turned to flight let god rule my life how long it is to be but i shall never be take me to flight chapter eighteen the fall of king ingi but when john and his fellows had riven that arm of king ingi's array then fled they and many withal who had stood nighest thereto and then the array sundered and were confounded but hakon and his set on fast and by then it was come towards dawn then was it sought to the banner of king ingi and in that brunt fell king ingi but worm his brother upheld the fight now many folk fled up into the town worm fared twice into the town after the fall of the king and egged on the folk and either time he went back out on the ice and upheld the fight 
then hakon and his sought to that arm of the array whereof was simon sheath captain and in that brunt there fell out of ingi's host gudbrand the son of shavehugh kinsman-in-law to the king but simon sheath and hallward hitch went at each other and fought with their companies and drove out beyond thrallsburg and in that brunt they fell both of them simon and hallward worm the king's brother got good word there but at last he fled the winter before worm had betrothed to him ragna the daughter of nicholas mew whom king eystein haroldson had had and he was to go to his bridal the next sunday blaze mass was then on a friday worm fled east into sweden to magnus his brother who was then king there but their brother ragnavald was earl there these were the sons of ingerid and henry the halt who was a son of the dane king svein the son of svein kristin the king's daughter dight the body of king ingi and he was laid in the stone wall in hallward's church out away from the choir on the south side by that time he had been king for five-and-twenty winters in this battle many folk fell on either side yet by much the most out of the host of ingi out of that host fell arni the son of Fryric, but hakon's men seized the goods of the bridal and a mighty lot of other plunder chapter nineteen of king hakon and kristin the king's daughter king hakon laid all the land under him and put his men into all offices and over the cheaping steads king hakon and his men had their meetings in hallward's church when they were reading the land reads kristin the king's daughter gave gifts to the priest who guarded the keys to hide one of her men in the church that he might hear the talk of hakon and his men but when she was aware of their counsels she sent word to her husband erling askew and Bjorgvin that he should never trust them chapter twenty a miracle of king olaf's among the veerings this tiding fell at stickelstead in norway as is afore writ that king olaf cast from him the sword hanaitir when as he got his wound but a certain man swedish of kin had broken his sword and he took up the sword hanaitir and fought therewith this man got away out of the battle and fared with other fleers and came forth into sweden and home to his house he had that sword all his life long and his son after him and each of those kinsmen took it one after other and ever that followed the owning of the sword that each told the other the name of the sword and withal whence it was come but that was mickle later in the days of Karialax, the mickle garth kaiser that there were in the garth great companies of beerings that befell withal one summer when the kaiser was out on certain warfare that they lay in war booths the veerings kept guard and waked over the king and they lay on the fields without the camp they shared the night between them for waking and they who had watched before lay down and slept and all of them were fully weaponed it was a want of theirs whenever they laid down to sleep that each had the helm on his head and his shield over him and his sword under his head he should lay his right hand on the grip a certain one of those fellows to whom was allotted the ward of the last part of the night when he woke at dawn there was his sword away from him but when he sought he saw the sword where it lay on the field far aloof he stood up and took the sword thinking that his fellows who had waked would have done it to mock him to beguile the sword away from him but they all denied it this same thing befell for three nights then he wondered greatly he and those others who saw and heard this and men would be searching as to what might be at the bottom of this then told he that the sword was called hanaitir and that olaf the holy himself had owned it and borne it in the battle of stickelstead and he told them also how it had fared with the sword sithens thereupon these things were told to king karelax and he let call the man to him who fared with the sword and gave him gold three prices of the sword and the king let bear the sword to olaf's church which is upheld by the veerings and sithens it was there over the altar eindred the young was in mickle garth when these things happened and he told this tale in norway even as einar the son of skully witnesseth in that droppa which he made on king olaf the holy for there is sung this hap 
chapter twenty one another miracle of king olaf this hap was in greekland while kareelax was king there that the king fared on warfare into the lackmen's land and when he came upon the fields of pozina there came against him a heathen king with an overwhelming host thither they had brought horse host and much big wains with battlements on the top when they dight night dwelling they set up the wains one beside the other outside their camp but outside of them they dug a huge ditch and all that work was as great as a burg might be the heathen king was blind but when the king of the greeks came the heathen set their array on the fields outside the wainburg and the greeks set their array there against and then each rode against the other and fought fared it then ill and unhappily in that the greeks fled and had gotten mickle man time but the heathen won the victory then the king manned an array of franks and flemings who then rode out against the heathen and it fared with them after the fashion of the former in that many were slain all fled who got away then was the king of the greeks much wroth with his warriors and they answered him and bade him then take to the veerings his wine-skins the king says thus that he would not waste his best having so as to lead a few men howsoever valiant against so mickle an host then thorir barnacle who was then captain of the veerings answered thus the words of the king even though there were before us a flaming fire i and my folk would forthwith run against it if i knew that thereby would be bought peace to thee king for the time to come but the king answered behite ye to your holy king olaf for your avail and victory the veerings had of men four hundreds and a half then they took oath under hansel and behite to rear a church in micklegarth at their own costs with the aid of good men and to let hallow that church to the honour and glory of the holy king olaf sithens ran the veerings forth into the field and when that saw the heathen they told their king that once more fared a band out of the greek king's host upon them and this said they is but a handful of men then said the king who is that noble-looking man who rideth there on a white steed before their band naught do we see him said they no less were the odds there than that sixty heathen were against one christian man yet none the less the veerings held into the battle all boldly but so soon as they came together the host of the heathen was smitten with dread so that they took to flight forthwith and the veerings drave them and speedily slew a mickle many but when the greeks and the franks who had erst fled the heathen saw this then they sought thereto and drave the flight with them by then the veerings had got into the wainburg and there was the most manfall and when the heathen fled the heathen king was taken and the veerings had him with them and thus the christians took the camp of the heathen and the wainburg end of the story of hakon shoulder broad part two chapter eleven through twenty one section seventy four of heims kringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and iriker magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of king magnus son of erling part one chapter one through ten chapter one the beginnings of king magnus erlingson sithens erling was ware of this what was the reed making of hakon and his he sent bidding to all lords of whom he wotted that they had been trusty friends of king ingi and also to those of the bodyguards and liegemen of the king who had got away and to the house carls of gregory and made a meeting appointed and when they met and had their talk they forthwith took the reed to hold together their flock and this they bound with fast words betwixt them sithence they talked hereof whom they should take to king and erling asked you spake and sought if it were the reed of lords and other rich men to take to king the son of simon sheath the daughter's son of king harold gilly and if john halkison would be at the head of the flock but john begged off then they tried nicholas skjaldvorsson a sister's son of king magnus barefoot if he would become lord of the flock he answered on this wise that that was his reed that he should be taken to king who was come of kingly kin 
and he for the ruling of the flock in whom wits might be looked for and said that that would be better for the hosting then they tried arney king's stepfather if he would let take to king any of his sons brothers to king ingi he answered that the son of christen the daughter's son of king sigurd was best born of kin for the kingdom of norway and there is said he a man to be found to lead his counsels who is in duty bound to look after his affairs and the realm where erling his father is a wise man hard ready and much tried in battle and a man good at ruling in the land he will not lack for furtherance of this reed if good luck be with it many took well to this reed erling answers so here i herein as if most who have been sought to on this matter had rather bag off of the trouble now it seems to me even as sure though i should take to this matter whatever happens that the honour shall be fast to him who ruleth the flock as that things may fare the other way even as it hath now fared with mickle many who have taken up such big matters that for that they have tined all their own and life with all but if this affair should speed well it may be that there be some who then would like to have chosen this task for themselves and he will need this who goes into this trouble to set strong stays thereto that he sit not under the withstanding and enmity of them who now are bound to this reed all yea said it to make that fellowship with full cloth then erling spake that is to say of me that i deem it next to my bane to go to serve hakon and though methinketh this most perilous yet i will rather risk it to let you to look thereto and i shall take upon me the command of the flock if that be the reed and desire of all of you and ye are all willing to bind this with sworn oaths they all yea said it and at this meeting it was settled that they should take magnus the son of erling to king after this they held a thing in the town and at that thing magnus was taken to king over the whole land being then five winters old sithence went all men under his hand who were there and had been king ingi's liegemen before and they had each one the same name boot that they had had erst with king ingi chapter two king magnus journey to denmark erling askew arrayed his fairing and betook him aboard ship and took with him king magnus and all the liegemen that were there at the time in that journey were arney king's stepfather and ingerid the mother of king ingi and two of her sons and john kutiza the son of sigurd stork and the house carls of erling and also those who had been the house carls of gregory and they had ten ships altogether they fared south to denmark to meet king waldemar and Berit's son of henry the brother of king ingi king waldemar was a nigh kinsman of king magnus they were sisters daughters of king harold from the garths in the east he being the son of waldemar the son of jeris leith these to wit ingi bjorg the mother of king waldemar and malmfrid the mother of christen the mother of king magnus king waldemar gave them a good welcome and erling and he were long in meetings and counselling and that came up from their talk that king waldemar should grant king magnus all the aid from his realm which he might need for to make norway his own and sithens to hold it but waldemar was to have that dominion in norway which his former kin had had harold gormson and svein twybeard to wit the whole of the wick north to rygiar bit and this council was bound with oaths and treaties sithens erling and his arrayed there fearing from denmark and sailed up from Vendis kagi chapter three battle in tunsberg fared king hakon in the spring straightway after easter north to thrandheim he had then all the ships which king ingi had had afore hakon had a thing in the town of cheaping and there was he taken to king over all the land then gave he earldom to sigurd of ryer and there was he taken to earl sithens fared hakon and his back south and all the way east to wick and the king went to tunsberg and sent earl sigurd east to king's rock toward the land with some of his host should erling come from the south erling and his came to ogdir and forthwith took the way north to Bjorgvin. there they slew arney fickle skull king hakon's bailiff and went thence again eastward to meet king hakon 
but earl sigurd had not been made ware of erling's journey from the south and was still east at the elf but king hakon was still in tunsberg erling laid by hoarseness and lay there for certain nights and king hakon made ready in the town erling made for the town took a certain hulk and laded it with wood and halm and set fire to it but the wind blew into the town and the hulk drave up townward he let bear two cables on the hulk and tied thereto two cutters which he let row in such wise after the hulk as the wind drove it before them now when the fire was come much anigh the town they aboard the cutters held to the cables so that the town should not burn then the smoke drave so thick into the town that naught might be seen from the bridges whereas the king's array stood then laid erling with all his host in from without on the windward of the fire and they erling and his host shot at them but when the townsfolk saw that the fire was nearing their houses and many got wounded from shot they took their reed and sent priest roald long talk out to find erling and to take truce for them and their town from erling and they broke up the king's array when roald told them the truce was granted by erling and when the host of the townsfolk was gone then thinned the host on the bridges yet some of hakon's men egged on to withstanding but onan the son of simon who had most to say in the rule of the host spoke out thus no wise shall i fight for the dominion of earl sigurd and he nowhere near thereupon fled onan and then all the host that was with the king and they up in land and there fell much folk of hakon's host so was sung then quoth onan never would he strive in the brunt of battle till from the south earl sigurd should sail with all his house carls much folk of worthy warriors of magnus up the street fare but hard away from thenceward the hawks of hakon hide them thor bjorn scald askew says so thou loathest not lord to redden the teeth of the steed of troll wife i heard that in wide tunsberg lightly good luck went with thee the townsmen feared to meet there the rushing of the bright points a drad were the stems of steel din of flame and swayed elm bow king hakon fared over land ways north into thrandheim but when earl sigurd heard it then fared he with all the ships he could get northward by the outer way to meet king hakon chapter four of erling and hakon erling askew took all those ships in tunsberg which king hakon had owned there he got the beech board which king ingi had owned erling went afterwards and laid all the wick under king magnus sway and likewise all the land on his way to the north and that winter he sat in bjorgvin in those days erling let slay ingi bjorn sippel a landed man of king hakon north in the firths king hakon sat in thrandheim through the winter but the next spring he called out an host and arrayed him to fair south to have meeting with erling with him there were earl sigurd john son of svein eindred the young onan the son of simon philippus the son of peter philippus the son of gerd ragnaval kanta sigurd cape sigurd call frarik cockboat as bjorn of forland thor bjorn the son of gunnar rentmaster and stradbjarni chapter five of the host of erling erling was in bjornvin and had a great host he took the reed of forbidding the fairing of all such cheaping ships as were bound north for cheaping whereas he thought that over swift would news come to hakon if ships fared between them yet he gave out that the cause therefore was that the men of bjorgvin were worthier to have the goods aboard the ships though they were bought undearer of the men of the burdened ships than they might think due rather than it should be flitted to the hands of our foes and unfriends for their furtherance now gathered ships to the town whereas came many every day and none fared away then erling let set up ships that were the lightest and let the rumour fare that he would abide there and there make a stand backed up by his kinsmen and friends but one day erling let blow to a meeting of his shipmasters and gave leave to all skippers of cheaping ships to fare whithersoever they pleased and when men had got the leave of erling askew those who were masters of the ships of burden and already lay all bound to fare with their ladings some for chaffer some on other errands and the wind also was handy for sailing north along the land they had all sailed before nuns of that day those who were bound each one sought to his fairing most eagerly who had the swiftest ship and they raced each with other 
but when this gathered fleet came north to mere the host of king hakon was there before them and he himself was in gathering men and arraying them and summoned to him landed men and the men bound to hosting and had heard no tidings from bjorkvin a long while but now they got this one news from all the ships that fared from the south that erling askew had beached his ships in bjorkvin and that they would have to come to him there and that he had a mickle host thence hakon sailed for v isle and sent from him men into roundsdale sigurd the earl to wit and onun the son of simon to fetch him men and ships he also sent out men into either mere but when king hakon had tarried a few nights in the cheaping stead he put off and went somewhat further south and thought he would thereby dight his faring the swiftlier and that folk would the swiftlier come to him erling askew had given the cheaping ships leave to depart from bjorgvin on sunday but on tuesday when done were the foremasses the king's trumpet was blown and he summons to him his host as well as the townsfolk and let run out the ships which afore had been beached erling held a husting with his host and host-bound men and told them his mind named men for captains and let read out the list of those who were set down for the king's ship so closed the husting that erling bade each one to get ready in his room whereto he was set down and gave out that he should lose life or limb who should tarry behind in the town when he put off on board the beach board worm king's brother put off in his ship forthwith that night and most of the ships which had been afloat heretofore chapter six of erling askew on wednesday ere masses were sung in the town erling put off from the town with all his host and they had one and twenty ships there was a humming wind for faring from the south along the land erling had with him magnus's son many landed men were there and they had the goodliest host when erling sailed north past the first he sent in a cutter out of the way to the house of john the son of halkel and let take nicholas the son of simon sheath and of maria the daughter of harold gilly and they had him with them out to the host and he fared aboard the king's ship on the friday so soon as it dawned they sailed into stonebite king hakon lay them in that haven which height and had fourteen ships himself with his men was up on the island a-playing but his landed men sat on a certain howl they saw how a boat rode from the south towards the island two men were there in it and let themselves fall forward down to the keel of the boat and pull their oars no less wildly and when they came aland they made not the boat fast but ran both of them that saw the mighty men and spake between themselves that these men would to tell tidings and stood up and went to meet them and so soon as they met onun the son of simon said know ye aught to tell of erling ask ye that ye fare so wildly he answered who might first bring out word for weariness here saileth erling from the south upon you with twenty ships or nigh thereto and many of them mightily big and speedily will ye see their sails then answered eindred the young over nigh to the nose quoth the carl when he was shot in the eye and speedily they went thereto where was the play and next then spake the horn and the war-blast was blown for the whole host to wend to the ships most eagerly and this was at the time of day when meat was much dight all the folk made for the ships and each one leaped aboard that ship which was nighest to him and the ships were manned unevenly thereupon they take to their oars while some rear the masts and turn the ships northward and make for v isle because they looked there for much help from the townsfolk chapter seven the fall of king hakon next to this they see the sails of erling and his and so each the other eindred the young had the ship which was called drag pay a great long ship bus which had become undermanned as they who were on board her before had run aboard other ships and this was the hindmost of hakon's ships but when eindrid came over against the isle of sack then came beach board after them which erling askew steered and erling lashed the ships together by then hakon was well nigh come into the isle when they heard the trumpets going for those ships that were nearest turned back and would give help to eindrid and then either side thrust into battle as they might bring it about many sails came down athwart ship and none were grappled but they lay board to board this battle was not long ere the crew aboard king hakon's ship broke up some fell some leaped overboard hakon cast over him a gray cape and leaped into another ship but when he had been there for but a little while he deemed he wotted that he was come there among unfriends 
and when he bethought him he saw none of his men nor his ships right near so he went on board beach board and forward amongst the forecastle men and craved quarter and the forecastle men took him to them and gave him quarter in this brunt there had been a mickle manfall yet more of the men of hakon on beach board was fallen nicholas the son of simon sheath and the slaying of him was laid to erling's own men after this there was a lull in the battle and the ships on either side got clear of each other then it was told to erling that king hakon was there aboard the ship and that his forecastle men had taken him to them and behight toward him erling sent a man forward and bade tell the forecastle men so to guard hakon that he should not get away and said that he would not speak against it that the king should have life if that were the reed of the chief men and that thereupon peace should be settled all the forecastle men bade him speak hailest of lords then let erling blow up fiercely and bade men this that they should lay to those ships which were yet unridded and said they would never get a better chance for avenging of king ingi then they all whooped the war-whoop and each egged on the other and fell to their oars for the onset in this turmoil king hakon was hurt deadly but after his fall and whereas his men became ware of it they rowed hard on and cast away their shields and hewed two-handed and heeded their life no longer this overboldness soon turned to them to mickle scathe whereas erling's men saw the bare hewing steads on them and fell a mickle deal of hakon's host and that went most thereto that the odds were great and hakon's men spared themselves but little but none needed to name truce of hakon's men save such alone as mighty men took into their power and hanseled ransom for these men fell of the host of hakon sigurd cape sigurd call ragnaval kunta but some ships got away and men rode into the firths and saved their lives thereby the body of king hakon was brought into Ramsdale and was buried there king sverer his brother let flit the corpse of king hakon north to cheaping and laid it in the stone wall in christ church on the south side of the choir chapter eight the flight of the captains of king hakon sigurd and eindred the young onan son of simon freric cockboat and yet more chiefs held the flock together they left the ships in Ramsdale and fared thence to the uplands erling askew and king magnus fared with their host north to cheaping and laid all the land under them wheresoever they fared sithens let erling summon the thing of ares and there magnus was taken to king over all the land but erling did not tarry there long for he deemed the thrandheimers were not trusty to him and his son and now magnus was called king of all the land king hakon was a man somewhat fair of look well grown tall and slender he was much broad of shoulder wherefore his men called him hakon shoulder broad but whereas he was young of years other chiefs had hand in his counsels with him he was merry-hearted and humble in his speech playful and behaved after the manner of youths well befriended he was of all the commonalty chapter nine the beginnings of king sigurd marcus o'shaw was the name of an upland man a kinsman of earl sigurd marcus gave fostering to a son of king sigurd who also hight sigurd and after this the uplanders took sigurd to king by the reed of earl sigurd and other chiefs who had followed king hakon and still they had a powerful host fared off their flock a twain the king and marcus were less on the wind board but earl sigurd and other chiefs with their companies were more in face of the peril they fared with their flock most about the uplands but whiles down into the wick erling askew had ever with him his son magnus and he also had under his rule all the host of the fleet and the warding of the land he was in bjorgvin some while that autumn and fared thence east into wick and set up in tunsberg and arrayed for wintering there he gathered in from about the wick scat and dews such as the king owned and had also a goodly host and mickle but inasmuch as earl sigurd had but little from the land and his following was many his wealth soon ran short and wheresoever chiefs were not near wealth was sought all lawlessly some deal by reckless guilt charges some deal by bare robbery chapter ten earl sigurd doomed in that time stood the realm of norway in mickle bloom the bond of folk were wealthy and mighty and unwanted to the unfreedom and unpeace of the flocks and there befell speedily much talk and many tales when robberies were done the men of wick were full friends of king magnus and of erling mostly for the cause of their friendship for king ingi the son of harold whereas the wick folk had always with their strength served under that shield erling let ward be holden over the town and twelve men waked every night 
erling would ever be holding things with the bonders and oft was that talked of the turbulence of the men of sigurd and by the talking over of erling and other men of the host was gotten of the bonders great cheer to this that it would be a mickle happy work that men should let that flock thrive never arney king's stepfather spake long on this matter and hard at the close for he bade this to all men who were at the thing both the men of erling's host and the bonders and the townsfolk to make weapon take to this end to doom by law earl sigurd and all the flock of them both alive and dead to the devil and by the fierceness of the folk and their fickleness they all yea said it and this unheard of deed was done and settled even according to what was laid down by law as to dooms at things priest roald long talk spake on this affair he was a man nimble of speech and his speech came much to the same point as all that had been spoken before erling feasted folk through yule at tunsberg and gave war wage there at candlemas end of the story of magnus son of erling part one chapter one through ten section seventy five of heims gringla by snorri storleson translated by george pope morris and ira kerr magnuson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of king magnus son of erling part two chapter eleven through twenty one chapter eleven of erling earl sigurd went with the flower of his host about the wick and many folk went under him by reason of his mastery and many paid fine in this wise he went far and wide about up inland and came down upon folk in sundry places some there were in his flock who privily sought truce with erling and answer came thereto that all men who asked therefore should have life and limb but they only should have land abiding who were not in great guilts against him but when the band heard that men should not have land abiding that held the flock much together for there were many who wadded themselves to be so proven as that erling would deem them much guilt bitten philippus the son of gerd made peace with erling and got back his lands and fared home to his estate but a little after thither came the men of sigurd and slew him many blows did each deal the other in chasings or manslaughters but that is not written wherein the lords had no dealings together chapter twelve erling gets news of earl sigurd it was in the early part of lent that news came to erling how earl sigurd would come to meet him and he was heard of here and there whiles anigh whiles further off so erling sent out spies so that he should be ware whereby they should come down every evening also he let blow all his host up from the town and they lay out night long all gathered and all the host arrayed in ranks then came news to erling that earl sigurd and his were a short way thence away up at ray so erling arrays his faring from the town and had with him all the townsfolk that were fight-worthy and weaponed likewise all chapmen save twelve men who were left behind to guard the town he left the town on tuesday in the second week of long fast after nuns and every man took with him two days victual. they fared away that night and it was slow for them to bring the host out of the town for every one horse and every one shield were two men and when the host was tallied it was nigh on thirteen hundreds of men and when news came to them they were told that earl sigurd was in ray at a homestead which hight raveness with five hundreds of men then let erling call together the host and told them the tidings he had heard and all egged on to hide them on and fall on them unawares in their houses or else fight forthwith in the night erling spake and said thus that will be deemed likely that a meeting betwixt me and earl sigurd may speedily come to pass there are in their flock withal a many men whose handiwork might well be remembered of us in that they hewed down king ingi and so many others of our friends that it would be slow to tell the tale of them those deeds they did by the craft of the fiend and with wizardry and nithing ship for it standeth here in our laws and land right that no man has so fordone him as that it be not nithing ship or murder when as men be slain 
a night tide this flock has sought for itself such omens by the counsel of wizard folk that they should fight by night but not under sun have they withal by such like goings-on won such victory as to stride over the head of such a lord as they have laid to earth now have we often said and shown how abominable their ways seem to us in that they have broken into battle by night so therefore let us rather follow the example of those chiefs who are better known unto us and it is better to take after to fight in the bright day and in battle array than to steal by night upon sleeping men we have a good host against them seeing that theirs is no greater than it so shall we abide the day and the light and hold together in battle array if they will give us any onfall after that all the hosts sat down some tore down certain hayricks and made them lairs thereof some sat on their shields and so abode the daylight chill was the weather with drift of sleet chapter thirteen of earl sigurd's array earl sigurd had so first got the news that the host was come nigh upon them his men stood up and weaponed them and knew unclearly how mickle host erling and his had and some would flee but most would abide earl sigurd was a wise man and deft of speech but was not called a man of mickle daring and he also was fainer of fleeing and gat therefore mickle blame of his men but when it took light both sides fell to arraying their host earl sigurd ranked on a certain brent above the bridge betwixt it and the town fell thereby a little river but erling and his ranked them on the other side of the river at the back of their array there were men a horseback well weaponed they had the king with them the earl's men saw that the odds would be great and told it for reed to seek to the wood the earl answered ye tell me there goes no heart with me but now shall that be tried and let each one look to it that he neither flee nor falter ere i do we have a good fighting ground let them come over the bridge and when the banner cometh over the bridge then plunge we upon them down over the brent and now let no one flee from the other earl sigurd had a brown kirtle and a red cloak with tucked up skirts shoes of shanks leather on his feet he had a shield and a sword which was called bastard the earl said that wot god with me that rather than take mickle gold would i get in one stroke of bastard on erling askew chapter fourteen the fall of earl sigurd the host of erling askew would go forth towards the bridge but he spake bidding them go up along the river this is but a little river and no trouble in that way for the land is level thereby and so was it done the earl's array fared up along the brent over against them and when the brent came to an end and it was level and good across the river then spake erling that his men should sing paternoster and pray that they might gain the day who had the better cause then they sang curial aloud all of them and all beat their weapons on their shields but amidst that din slunk away and fled three hundreds of men out of erling's host erling and his host went over the river but the men of the earl whooped the war-whoop but the onfall down over the brent upon erling's array failed them and the battle befell on the slope of the brent and was first with spear thrusts and speedily thereon with handy strokes the banner of the earl fared a heel so that erling and his men got up upon the brent then was the battle short ere the earl's folk fled into the wood at their back then this was told to earl sigurd and men bade him flee he answered forth with us now while yet we may and forward they went right valiantly hewing on either hand in that brunt fell earl sigurd and john Sveinson, and nigh on sixty men erling and his lost but few men and drave the rout even unto the wood there erling stayed his host and turned aback he came thereto where thralls of the king would drag the raiment off earl sigurd who was not utterly dead though he knew naught he had stuck his sword into its sheath and it was lying there near him erling took it up and beat the thralls therewith and bade them crawl off after this erling turned back with his host and sat up in tunsberg seven nights after the fall of the earl the men of erling took eindred the young and he was slain chapter fifteen of marcus o'shaw and king sigurd marcus o'shaw and sigurd foster father and foster son betook them down into the wick when spring came on and there got them ships but when erling heard that he went east after them and they met at king's rock 
and marcus and his fled out into hissing isle and there drifted down to them the folk of the land the hissing dwellers and went into the array of marcus men erling and his rode to land and the men of marcus shot upon them then spake erling with his men take we their ships and go not up to fight a land host the hissing dwellers are ill to seek home hard men and unwise but a short while will they have this flock with them whereas hissing is a little land so was it done that they took the ships and brought them over to king's rock marcus and his folk fared up into the mark lands and were minded to fall on thence and now either side had news of the other erling had a much throng with him and drew therein to men from the country sides neither side as then fell on the other chapter sixteen the beginnings of archbishop eystein eystein the son of erland sloven was chosen for archbishop after the death of archbishop john eystein was hallowed the same year that king ingi fell but when archbishop eystein came to the sea he was in good favour with all the folk of the land he was a man right stirring and of great kindred and the thrandheimers gave him good welcome for most of the great men within thrandheim law were bound to the archbishop either by kinship or affinity and all in full friendship with him the archbishop then began to sound the bonders first talked he how needy of wealth the sea was and on the other hand what uprising it stood in need of now if it were to be upheld so much the more seemly than before as it was more of dignity than earth since an archbishop's chair had been set up there he bade this of the bonders to grant him in payment of fines to him a silver proof ounce but before he had taken the fine proof ounce which passed current in payment of fines to the king but these two ounces differ by one half the value of that which he would have the silver proof being by that much the better of the two now by the power of the friends and kinsmen of the archbishop and the shoving of himself this was brought about and it was doomed as law throughout all thrandheim law and all the folk lands that were within his archbishopric chapter seventeen of marcus and king sigurd when sigurd and marcus had lost their ships in the elf and saw that they might get no chance of erling they turned them to the uplands and so went by the overland road to thrandheim where they had a good welcome and there was sigurd taken for king at the heiress thing many of good men's sons there betook them to the flock they got them aboard ship and arrayed them busily and fared south to mere when it summered and took up all the king's dues wheresoever they went in bjorg then there were for the warding of the land nicholas the son of sigurd nokvi the son of paul and yet other captains of companies thorolf draler thorbjorn rentmaster and many others marcus and his sailed from the north and heard that the men of erling had a throng in bjorgvin so there they sailed by the outer course and south about it men would be saying that that summer the men of marcus had fair wind whithersoever they would fare chapter eighteen the slaying of king sigurd and marcus erling askew so soon as he had learnt that marcus and his had turned them to the north held north into wick and drew to him folk and was soon many manned and had big ships and many but as he sought out into wick and he fell in with contrary winds and lay in havens here and there all that summer but when marcus and his came east to listy they heard that erling had an overwhelming host in the wick and therewith they turned back north and when they came into hordland they were minded for bjorgvin and when they were off the town nicholas and his came rowing from within against them and had folk micklemore and ships bigger saw then marcus and his that there was naught to choose than to row south away so some made out for the main some south into the sound some into the firths but marcus with some company ran up a land in the island called scarpa nicholas and his took their ships gave truce to john son of halkel and some other men but slew most that they caught some days later eindred healthfully found sigurd and marcus and they were fretted to bjorgvin sigurd was to hewen out from gravedale but marcus was hanged with another man on wharfness and this was michaelmas then the flock that had followed them drifted asunder chapter nineteen of erling and the hissing dwellers frerik cockboat and biarni the evil onan son of simon and ornolf rind 
had rowed out into the main sea with sundry ships and held on out by the high sea course east round the land but wheresoever they came aland they robbed and slew the friends of erling but when erling heard of the slaying of sigurd and marcus he gave home leave to landed men and hosting bound folk but he himself held with his own folk east across the fold for he had news of the men of marcus being there erling held for king's rock and dwelt there the autumn through in the first week of winter fared erling out into hissing isle with much folk and craved there a thing the hissing dwellers came down and held up the thing erling laid gilts at their hands in that they had run into flock with marcus men and arrayed an host against him ozer hight the man who was richest among the bonders and who spoke on their behalf the thing was long and at last the bonders hand sell judgment to erling and he appointed a meeting within a week in the town and named fifteen men of the bonders to come thither but when they came erling doomed against them to pay three hundreds of neat fare the bonders home and like their lot but ill a little after the river was laid with ice and erling's ship was frozen in and then withheld the bonders the fine and laid them into a gathering a while erling arrayed there for a yule feast but the hissing dwellers had a guild ale and held their fellowship through yule tide the night after the fifth day of yule erling fared out into the island and took the house on ozer and burnt him therein and slew in all ten tents of men and burnt three homesteads and fared sithens back to king's rock sithens came the bonders to him and paid him the fine chapter twenty the slaying of frarik cockboat and biarni the evil erling askew got ready so soon as it was spring when he might float his ships for ice and fared from king's rock he heard that they harried north in the wick who had erst been marcus men erling held spies over their fairings and went to seek them and found them as they lay in a certain haven onan the son of simon and ornolf rhine got away but frarik cockboat and biarni the evil were laid hands on and much of their fellowship slain erling let bind frarik to an anchor and cast overboard and for that work was erling the most ill-liked within the frandheim laws for frarik had there the best of kindred biarni erling let hang he spake the foulest of words as his wont was ere he was hanged so says thor bjorn scald askew erling drew on the viking's fate on the wickfirth's east side was many a man of cockboat gat hurt as there he fared on fared was a fluke twixt shoulders of frarik but the ill-willed biarni to men unhelpful gainst tree hung somewhat higher onund and ornolf and all the bands that had got away fled to denmark but were whiles in goutland or in the wick chapter twenty one parleys between erling and the archbishop erling askew afterwards held on to tunsberg and tarried there long through the spring but when it summered he went north to bjorgvin where was then all mickle throng there was then stephanus a legate from romberg and archbishop eystein and other inland bishops there also was brand to boot who was then hallowed for iceland there was also john the son of lopt the daughter's son of king magnus barefoot and at that time had king magnus and other kinsmen of john owned to his kinship archbishop eystein and erling askew would often be talking privily together and one time was that in their talk that erling said is it true lord what men say that thou hast eked the price of the ounce to thee for fines from the bonders in the north country the archbishop answers that is very sooth that the bonders have granted it to me to eke the price of the ounce for my fines they have done that at their free will and through no hard dealings of mine and thereby they have eked god's glory and the wealth of our sea said erling is it so lord that this be according to the laws of king olaf the holy or hast thou taken this matter aught beyond what is written in the law-book the archbishop answers so will the holy king olaf have framed his laws as he gat the yea word and the good will of all the folk thereto but it is not to be found in his law that the eking of god's right be banned erling said as ye will eke thy right so wilt thou will to strengthen us herein that even as much we eke the king's right the archbishop answers thou hast eked now by enough 
the name and the dominion of thy son magnus but if i have unlawfully gotten the price of the ounce from the thrandheimers am i then minded that the law-breaking beareth bigger that he should be king over the land who is not a king's son there is neither law thereto nor example in the land erling said when magnus was taken to king over norway's realm that was done with the wadding and reed of thee and other bishops here in the land answers the archbishop thou behidest then erling if we were of one mind with thee that magnus were taken to king that thou wouldst strengthen god's right in all places with all thy might i say yea thereto said erling that i have behight to uphold god's law and the land right with all my strength and the king's now i see here better read than that each of us should lay white words on the other let us rather hold to all our privy pledges strengthen ye magnus to the realm as thou hast behight but i shall strengthen thy dominion in all things profitable then fared all the talk smoothly between them then spake erling if magnus be taken to king even as goeth custom of yore here in the land then must thou of thine own might give him a crown as be god's laws on the smearing of a king to power but though i be not a king nor come down from a kingly race yet have most of them who have been kings within my memory been such as not to know as well as i did what was law or the land's right but the mother of magnus is the daughter of a king and a queen wedlock born magnus withal is the son of a queen who was a lawful wife and if thou wilt give him the king's hallowing sithens none may rightly bereave him of the kingdom naught was william the bastard a king's son yet he was hallowed and crowned to king over england and sithens has the kingdom of england been held in his kindred and all have been crowned naught was svein wolfson in denmark a king's son and yet he was a crowned king there and his sons after him and one after another of those kinsmen have been crowned kings now here in the land is an arch sea and that is a great honour and dignity to our land eke we it now with good things and have we a king crowned no less than have the englishmen and the danes sithens the archbishop and erling talked this matter over often and thereupon the archbishop bore the matter before the legate and easily gat the legate turned so as to be of one mind with him and then the archbishop had a meeting with the suffragan bishops and other clerks and bare this matter before them and they all answered with one accord saying that that was their read as the archbishop would have it be and they all urged that the hallowing should go forward so soon as they found that that was what the archbishop was pleased to let so be so then this was the judgment of all End of the story of king magnus son of erling part two chapter eleven through twenty one section seventy six of heims kringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and ira kerr magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of king magnus son of erling part three chapter twenty two through thirty two chapter twenty two the hallowing of king magnus erling asked you let array in the king's garth a mighty feast and the great hall was hung with pall and bench cloths and all fitted up at exceeding great cost there was feasted the court and all the household service and a multitude of guests and many lords then magnus took king's hallowing of archbishop eystein and at that hallowing were other five bishops and the legate and a throng of clerks erling askew and twelve landed men with him swore oath to the laws with the king and on the day when was the hallowing the king and erling gave banquet to the archbishop and the legate and all the bishops and that feast was of the most glorious father and son giving then many great gifts at this time king magnus was eight winters old and had then been king for three winters chapter twenty three of the messengers of the dane king by this time king waldemar of denmark had heard the tidings from norway that now magnus was sole king there and that scattered were all other flocks there in the land so the king sent his men with letters to the two king magnus and erling 
calling to their mind the privy pledges which erling had bound with king waldemar even as heretofore is written to wit that king waldemar should own of the wick from the east unto ridgejarbit if magnus should become sole king over norway and when the messengers came forward and showed to erling the letters of the dane king and he understandeth the claim the dane king hath on norway erling brought this before other men upon whose reed he threw himself but they said all one and the same thing that never should the danes have part in norway for men said that that had been the worst age there in the land when the danes had power over norway the dane king's messengers told their errand before erling and craved a clear say of him erling bade them fare with him in harvest tide east into the wick saying that he would then give a clear answer when he had met the men of the wick who were the wisest chapter twenty four of erling and the men of wick in the autumn erling askew went east into wick and abode in tunsberg and he sent men over to berg and let summon there a four folks thing sithens fared erling thither with his folk and when the thing was set then erling spake and told what counsels had been made fast between him and the king of denmark when erling and his had raised this flock for the first time now will i said he hold all pledges which we made then if that be the will and desire of you bonders rather to serve under the king of denmark than the king who here is hallowed and crowned king to this land the bonders answered erling and said thus for naught will we become the dane king's men so long as one of us wick dwellers is alive rushed forth then all the throng of them with whooping and calling and bade erling hold his oaths which he had then sworn to all the folk of the land to ward the land of thy son but we shall all follow thee and therewith the thing broke up after that the messengers of the dane king went back south to denmark and told of their errand even as it was the danes laid great blame on erling and on all northmen saying they were never proven in aught but evil and the rumour went abroad that the dane king would have his host out next spring and harry norway erling went in the harvest tide north to Bjorgvin, and sat there through the winter and gave out war pay there chapter twenty five letters of the thrandheimers that winter fared certain danes about the country inland saying that as oft befell they were going to the holy king olaf to wake but when they came to thrandheim they met there many mighty men and told their errand to wit that the dane king had sent them to the thrandheimers to seek their friendship and welcome if he should come into the land and he promised to give them both dominion and wealth with this message there went a letter of the dane king under his seal and therewith a bidding that the thrandheimer should send him in return letters under seal this they did and most men took well to the message of the dane king the messengers went back east again when lenten fast was wearing erling sat in Bjorgvin, and when spring came erling's friends told him what rumour they had learnt from men of ships of burden from the north from thrandheim the import thereof being that the thrand folk were his open foes and that they gave it out at their things that if erling came to thrandheim he would never come out past Agderness with his life erling said that was but slander and fool talk erling gave out that he would be faring south to unarheim to rogation day's thing and let array a twenty bench cutter and a fifteen bench scow and a victualling ship of burden withal but when the ships were all bound strong southerly gales came on on tuesday in rogation days let erling blow his folk to the ships but men were loath to leave the town and deemed it ill to row against the wind erling laid his ships north into bishop's shaven then spake erling ill do ye murmur at rowing in the teeth of the wind so fall to now and raise the masts and hoist sail and so let the ships go north so did they and sailed north that day and the night 
on wednesday towards eve they sailed in past ogdirness and there there was a great fleet before them ships of burden and other ferries and cutters and this was an host for a wake on its way into the town part of it going before them part abaft them wherefore the townsfolk were not heeding the sailing of long ships chapter twenty six of erling and the thrandheimers erling came to the town at the time when matins were being sung up at christ church erling and his made a rush into the town and they were told that alf the red the son of otar breitling a landed man was still sitting and drinking with his following erling set upon them and alf was slain and most of his following few other men fell for most folk were gone to church this was in the night before ascension day straightway the next morning erling let blow all folk out to air thing and at this thing erling bore charges against the thrandheimers and laid on them treason against the king and himself and he named bard cocktail and paul son of andreas and rosbard who then had in charge the town lands and a great many others they answered and pleaded not guilty then erling's chaplain stood up and held up many letters and seals and asked if they knew their seals there which they had sent in the spring to the king of denmark and then were the letters read out there moreover were the danish men with erling who had fared in the winter with the letters for it was erling who had got them to do this and now they gave out before all people the words which each one had spoken this thou didst say rosbard smiting thy breast out of this breast came from the first all these reeds bard answered i was mad then my lord when i said such things so there was no other way out of this but to hand sell erling doom on all the case and straightway he took an exceeding deal of wealth from many men and laid down as ungilled some all them that were slain fared erling sithen's back south to bjorgvin chapter twenty seven king waldemar's raid on norway king waldemar had out that spring a mickle host in denmark and made with that host north for the wick straightway when he came into the realm of norway's king then had the bonders a gathering before him and a throng of men the king fared peacefully and quietly but wheresoever they fared on the mainland men would shoot at them even if there were but one or two and that the danes deemed full ill will to them of the people of the land but when they came to tunsberg king waldemar summoned a thing at Hows, but none sought thereto from the countrysides then king waldemar spake to his host on this wise easily is it to be seen of this land's folk that they all stand against us now we have two choices on hand one to fare the war-shield over the land and spare nothing neither man nor goods the other to fare south again with things as they are and it is more to my mind to fare into eastern ways to heathen lands which lie broad enough before us rather than to slay down christian folk however worthy they be thereof but all the others were eager for harrying yet the king had his way in that they fared back south yet all wide was robbing toward in the out isles and wheresoever the king himself was not near so they went south to denmark and nothing of tidings befell chapter twenty eight erling's journey to jutland erling askew heard that the dane king was come into the wick and he called out the all men host from all the land both of men and ships and that was the greatest rush to arms and he held all that host east along the land but when he came east to lindendisness he heard that the dane host was gone back south to denmark and that they had robbed far and wide about the wick then erling gave home leave to all the hosting bound folk but he himself and sundry landed men sailed with a much many ships south after the danes to jutland and when they came there where it is hight deer's river there lay before them the danes come back from the hosting with many ships erling set upon them and fought with them the danes fled away speedily and lost many men but erling and his robbed the ships and the cheaping stead and got their full mickle fee and fared sithens back to norway so for a while there was unpeace betwixt norway and denmark chapter twenty nine erling's journey to denmark Kristen, king's daughter fared that autumn south to denmark and went to king waldemar her kinsman they were children of two sisters 
the king gave her exceeding good welcome and made over to her such grants as that she might get her men well holden there she would often be talking to the king and he was all blithe with her but next spring christen sent men to erling and bade him go meet the dane king and make peace with him the summer after was erling in the wick and he dight a long ship and manned it with the goodliest of his folk and then sailed over unto jutland he heard that king waldemar was in randois and thither erling sailed and came to the stead when most folk were sitting at the meat but when they had rigged their tilts and moored the ship erling went up with eleven men all burning with hats over their helms and swords under their cloaks and went to the king's chamber then was faring in the service and the door was open and erling and his went in straightway up to the high seat and erling spoke truce will we have king both here and for our home faring the king looked round at him and said art thou there erling he answered erling is here and tell us speedily whether we shall have truce there were within eighty of the king's men and all weaponless the king said truce shall ye have erling as thou cravest on no man do i dastardly if he come to see me then erling kissed the king's hand and walked out sithens to his ship there he tarried for a while with the king and they talked over a peacemaking between them and the two lands and they agreed that erling should abide there as hostage with the dane king and asbjorn snare the brother of archbishop absalom should go to norway as hostage in return chapter thirty king waldemar's talk with erling that was on a time when king waldemar and erling were talking that erling said lord that meseemeth likeliest to peace that ye have all that of norway which was behight in our privy talk and if it be so what lord wouldst thou set thereover any dane perchance nay says the king says erling no lords from denmark will will to fare to norway and have there to deal with a hard and unyielding people they who already be here in a good case with thee for that sake i fared hither that for naught will i miss thy friendship hither to denmark have fared afore men of norway such as hakon iverson and finn arneson and thy kinsman king Svein, made both his earls now i am in norway a man of no less might than were they then and the king gave them holland to rule over a dominion that was his own before now meseemeth lord that thou mightest well grant me this fief in norway if i become thy man and be under thine hand so that i hold this dominion of thee likewise also that king magnus my son may not forbid me this but i will be linked to thee and owe thee all the service which that name maketh due such things talked erling and others of like kind and at last it came to this that erling went under king waldemar's hand and the king led him to seat and gave him earldom and the wick for a dominion to rule over after that erling fared home to norway and was earl sithens while he lived and kept in peace with the dane king ever after erling had four base-born sons one hight rydar another ogmund both by one mother the third finn the fourth sigurd and their mother was asa the light they were the younger ones christen king's daughter and erling had a daughter hight ragnahild she was wedded to john the son of thorberg from ranberg christen left the land with a man called grim rake they went out to micklegarth and lived there for a while and had sundry children together chapter thirty one the beginnings of olaf olaf the son of gudbrand the son of shavehu and maria the daughter of king eystein magnusson was fostered at sigurd bait hats in the uplands but while erling was in denmark foster father and foster son olaf and sigurd raised a flock to which many uplanders betook themselves then was olaf taken to king there with their flock they went about the uplands but whiles down to the wick whiles east into the marklands but they were not shipped but when earl erling had news of this flock he fared with his host into the wick and kept to his ships through the summer and was in harvest tide in oslo and feasted there through yule he let hold spies about inland on the flock and went himself up country in search of them together with orm king's brother and when they came to the water called they took all ships that were round the water 
chapter thirty two a priest betrays erling the priest who sang at ridiocal which is on the water bade the earl and his to a feast to come there at candlemas the earl behight his bearing deeming good to go to ours there they rode thither over the water on the eve of the mass day but that priest had another reed on hand he sent men to bring news to olaf and his about the fairings of erling he gave erling and his strong drink through the evening and let them drink right much and when the earl and his went to sleep their beds were made in the banquet chamber but when they had slept for a little while the earl awoke and asked if it were time for matin song the priest said the night was but little spent and bade them sleep in quiet the earl answers many things do i dream to-night and ill do i sleep thereupon he fell asleep a second time he awoke and bade the priest stand up and sing the hours the priest bade the earl sleep saying it was midnight and the earl lay down and slept a little while and then leaped up and bade his men clothe themselves they did so and took their weapons and went to church and laid down the weapons outside while the priest sang the matin song end of the story of king magnus son of erling part three chapter twenty two through thirty two section seventy seven of heims kringla by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and iriker magnusson this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of king magnus son of erling part four chapter thirty three through forty four chapter thirty three fight at ridio call in the evening the news came to olaf and they walked that night six miles by road and men deemed that a wondrous walk they came upon ridiocol at matin song and pit murk it was as might be olaf and his made for the guest chamber and whooped the war-whoop and slew within some men who had not gone to the matin song but when erling and his heard the whoop they ran to their weapons and made a way down to the ships olaf and his met them against a certain garth wall and there was battle and erling and his moved down along the wall and the wall shielded them they had a much less folk fell a many of them many were wounded what helped them most was that olaf and his kenned them not so murk as it was but erling's men made sturdily on for the ships there fell ari thorgir's son the father of bishop gudmund and many others of erling's bodyguard erling was wounded on his left side and some men say that he himself drave his own sword against himself when as he drew it orm was also much wounded with great toil they got to their ships and thrust off from the land forthwith it was deemed that olaf and his had borne with them the greatest ill luck to this meeting seeing how erling and his were betrayed if olaf and his had but fared forth with more reed afterwards men called him olaf the unlucky but some called them hood swains they fared with that flock inland once again as erst but earl erling fared out into the wick to his ships and tarried the rest of the summer in the wick while olaf and his were up in the uplands or at wiles east in the marks and so held they the flock for the next winter chapter thirty four battle at stangs the next spring olaf and his went out into the wick and took there the king's dues and dwelt there long through the summer earl erling learned that and went with his host east to meet them and their meeting was on the east side of the firth where it is hight stangs there was mickle battle and earl erling had the victory there fell sigurd bait hat and many of olaf's men but he saved himself by flight and fared sithen south to denmark and was the next winter in jutland in alberg but the next spring olaf took the sickness which led him to death and he is laid in earth there at mary's church and the danes call him holy chapter thirty five the slaying of harold nicholas periwinkle the son of paul the son of Skopti, was a landed man of king magnus he laid hands on harold who was said to be the son of king sigurd haroldson 
and christen king's daughter brother to king magnus by the same mother nicholas brought harold to Beorgvin, and handed him over to earl erling it was the manner of erling when his unfriends came before him that he spake naught or few to them and measuredly what there was of it if he were of mind to slay them but those who he would should have life he ill-used in words to the utmost erling said but little to harold and men misdoubted them on what he was minded then men prayed king magnus to plead peace on behalf of harold with erling and the king did so the earl answered that is what thy friends arreed thee but thou wilt rule the realm for but a short while if thou followest upright counsels only sithen serling let flit herald over into northness and there was he to hewen chapter thirty six the beginnings of king eystein eysteinson eystein is named a man who was called the son of king eystein the son of herald he was at this time a young man not fully ripe it is told thereof that he came forth one summer up into swede realm and fared to find earl burgir brosa who at that time was wedded to brigida the daughter of harold gilly and sister to the father of eystein eystein set before them his errand and prayed them for a veil the earl yea and both of them took his case well and behind him their avail and he tarried there for a while earl burgir gave to eystein some folk and a good penny for his maintenance and sent him well out of hand and they both behide him their friendship then eystein fared north into norway and came down into the wick and forthwith folk flocked to him and that flock grew in strength and they took eystein for king and they fared into wick with that flock through the winter but inasmuch as their means ran short they robbed widely so landed men and bonders got folk together against them but when they were overborne by strength they fled away into the shaws and lay long out in the wild woods and their raiment went off them so that they wrapped birch bark about their legs wherefore the bonders called them birch legs they ran oft into the builded parts and came forth here and there and betook them to onset straightway wherever they had not too many men before them they had sundry fights with the bonders and now this now the other side got the best of it three pitched battles had the birch legs and gained the day in all in crookshaw they were well nigh undone for the bonder gathering came on them in throng the birch legs fell timbers athwart their way and ran sithens into the wood for two winters the birch legs were in the wick so that they came not into the north country chapter thirty seven of the birch legs king magnus and erling askew king magnus had been king for thirteen winters when the birch legs hove up the third summer they betook themselves to ships they fared along off the land and got them money and men at first they were in the wick but as the summer wore they set out for the north and went so speedily that no news went before them until they came to thrandheim the birch legs had in their flock most of markmen and elfgrims and very many they had from Thelmark and were now well weaponed eystein their king was fair-faced and goodly to look upon little-faced and not a mickle man by many folk he was called eystein maiden king magnus and earl erling sat in bjorgvin when as the birch legs sailed northward about them and were not aware of them erling was a rich man wise of wit the greatest warrior if unpeace were toward a good land counsellor and handy at rule he was called somewhat grim and hard-hearted but for this chiefly that he allowed but few of his unfriends land abiding even though they prayed for it and for that reason many chose to run to the flock so soon as such hove up against him erling was a tall man and hard-knit somewhat high-shouldered long-faced sharp-faced light of hue and became much hoary he bore his head somewhat halt merry-hearted was he and stately of mien he had raiment of ancient fashion long jerkins and long sleeves to kirtles and shirts welsh cloaks and high-laced shoes such attire he let the king wear while he was young but when he ruled himself he arrayed himself much bravely king magnus was light-hearted and playful of mickle merriment and a mickle wencher chapter thirty eight of nicholas nicholas the son of sigurd the son of rani was son of skialvor the daughter of brynjolf kamel who was sister to haldor the son of brynjolf and of one mother with king magnus barefoot 
nicholas was the most of lords he had a manor in hologoland in angle isle where tis hight stig nicholas owned a garth in nidois down below john's church on ground owned by chaplain thorgear nicholas was often cheeping and ruled all things among the townspeople eric arneson who was also a landed man had to wife skjaldvor the daughter of nicholas chapter thirty nine of eric and nicholas that was the latter merrymus when men went away from matin song in the town that eric went to nicholas and said father-in-law that say certain fishermen who are come from without that long ships be sailing into the firth and men guess that there will be the birch legs and this is the business father to let blow all the townsfolk with weapons out to the aries nicholas answered i fare not son-in-law after the gabble of fishermen i shall send spies out into the firth and to-day we shall hold a thing so eric went home and when it rang to high mass nicholas went to church then came eric to him and said i think father the tale must be true for here are now the men who say they saw the very sails meseemeth that reed to ride out of the town and gather us folk for meseemeth we are somewhat short of men in the town answered nicholas so quacksome as thou art son-in-law let us first hearken mass and then make our reeds sithens and nicholas went to church but when the mass was sung eric went to nicholas and said father-in-law now are my horses ready and i shall ride away nicholas answers farewell then we shall have a thing at the eyries and ken what folk we have in the town so eric rode away and nicholas went to his own house and then sat down to table chapter forty the fall of nicholas but at the time when the victuals were set a man came in and told nicholas that the birch legs were rowing into the river and nicholas called out that his men should weapon them and when they were weaponed nicholas bade them go into the loft and the unhandiest reed was that whereas if they had warded the garth then would the townsfolk have come to help them but the birch legs filled all the garth and sithens went all round about the loft now they called to each other and the birch legs offered nicholas truth but he nay said it sithens they fought and nicholas and his warded themselves with bow-shot and hand-shot and oven-stones but the birch legs hewed at the houses and shot at their swiftest nicholas had a red shield with gilt nails therein and starred with william's girth the birch legs shot so that the arrows stuck even up to the reed bands nicholas said now the shield lies to me there nicholas fell and a great part of his following and he was most bemoaned the birch legs gave truce to all the townsfolk chapter forty one eystein taken for king in the doice sithens was eystein taken to king and all folk went unto him for a while he tarried in the town and after went up into thrandheim there came much folk to him there thorfinn the swart of snows came to him with a following of men early in winter they went out to the town and then there came to them the sons of gudrun of saltness john kitten sigurd and william they fared up from nidois to orkdale and there were they tallied up to well nigh twenty hundreds of men fared they so to the uplands and thence out over thotten and hatheland and unto ring realm chapter forty two the fall of king eystein king magnus went east into the wick in the autumn with some of the host and with him went worm king's brother earl erling was left behind in bjorgvin and had there a much folk and he was to deal with the birch legs if they should fare by the west king magnus he and worm both sat in tunsberg and the king feasted there through the yuletide king magnus heard that the birch legs were up in ray so the king he and worm went out of the town with their host and came into ray there was deep snow on the ground and the weather was wondrous cold but when they came to the homestead they went out of the tun unto the road and without of the garth they ranked them and trampled the snow hard for themselves they had not full fifteen hundreds of men the birch legs were at the other stead and some of them here and there in houses but when they were ware of king magnus host they were fetched together and thrust into array so when they saw the folk of king magnus they thought as was sooth that theirs was the more and so gave battle forthwith but as they pushed forward along the road only few men abreast might get on but those who ran out of the road got snow so deep that they might scarce get on at all and so break their array but they fell who pushed on foremost along the road and then the banner was hewn down and they who were nighest shrank aback and some break into flight the men of king magnus followed them up and slew one after the other whomsoever they caught the birch legs might come now into no array 
and were bare before the weapons and then many fell and many fled and here it befell as oft will be however valiant and bold at arms men may be that if they get great strokes and break into flight most of them will be loath to come back took to flight now the main host of the birch legs and a many fell for the men of king magnus slew all that they might and to no man was peace given those whom they caught and the flight drifted wide ways about king eystein turned to flight and ran into a certain house and prayed for peace and that the bonder should hide him but the bonder slew him and then went to find king magnus and met him at raveness the king was in the guest chamber of baking him at the fire and there were many men sithen's men fared and flitted the body thither and the king bade men step up and ken the body a certain man sat on the cross dais in the corner and he was a birch leg but no man had given heed to him when he saw the body of his lord and kenned it he stood up swift and hard axe in hand and ran swiftly up the floor and hewed at king magnus and it came on the neck by the shoulder the man saw where the axe swept and shoved him aside whereby the axe turned down into the shoulder and that was a great wound then he reared the axe aloft a second time and hewed at worm king's brother he lay in the dais and the blow was aimed at both his legs but when worm saw that a man would slay him he turned thereat swiftly and cast his feet forward over his head and the axe came on the dais stock and stuck fast but weapons now stood so thick on the birch leg that he might scarce fall down then saw they that he had dragged over the floor after him his guts and that man's valour is right much bepraised king magnus men drave the flight long and slew all that which they might there fell thorfinn of snows fell there also many other thrandheimers chapter forty three of the birch legs this flock called birch legs had gathered together in great multitude and this was a folk hard and the men the boldest of men-at-arms their host was somewhat untamed and fared much turbulent and reckless when they deemed they had a great strength of their own they had in their flock few who were men of sober counsels or wont to the ruling of land or laws or to steer and host and though some of them were better knowing yet the band would have only that which seemed good to themselves deeming they might be without fear because of their multitude and valour but in what of the host got away there were many wounded and had lost their weapons and clothes and all were they moneyless some of them made eastward for the marklands many for fellmark most of those to wit who had kindred there some went all the way in east into swede realm all save themselves for little hope was harboured of truce from king magnus or earl erling chapter forty four of king magnus erlingson king magnus fared sithens back out to tunsberg and became all famed for this victory for it had been the saying of all folk that earl erling was breast and ward of that fatherhood but when king magnus had gained the day over such a strong flock and so throng and had had the lesser host all men were minded to think that he would overcome all and that he must be by as much the greater warrior than the earl as he was the younger than he end of the story of king magnus son of erling part four chapter thirty three through forty four end of heimskringla the stories of the kings of norway called the round world by snorri sturlson translated by george pope morris and ira magnusson